<laughs> what are we doing? We're doing CIP. So, um, welcome. Uh, ben, we'll turn it over to you, but we also have Mike Ackerlow from the administration who is here. Mm -hmm. So we left off on page, was it eight? Six? So you have a page in the packet for today is page 12. Oh yeah, yeah, so we're starting on page five as of my notes on our list. Oh, in the funding log, yes. Yep. Um, and I guess before we dive in, Ben, do you, are there any changes uh, that you wanna highlight before we get into it? The, there are no changes to the funding log except there's one new item that we just added this morning. I feel like this is really loud. Um, it's because last week it was really quiet. It's exactly. The new item is a tentative placeholder for parks impact fees for RDA projects in the second budget amendment. And they haven't been confirmed by the impact fee consultant, but if the council wanted to request it, there's a placeholder on the impact fee log for it. We're just gonna, is everyone in favor of requesting that? Will you? And just to clarify, the, the what we would be requesting is that the impact fee consultant review the RDA funding, um, the RDA budget amendment specifically, because that, that has the most detail about every project for any opportunity to use impact fees. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So that is, Andrew, are you in favor of that? Okay. So that's five in favor. Uh, Andrew is abstaining because he was reading. So he's ahead of, the, ahead of us. So. Uh, that is uh, five in favor. Ben. Great. Mr. Chair, sorry, I, I have three different CIPs one, and I have notes on all of them except the one that we just received. So I don't know what page I'm on. Can you just tell me like a title <laughs> of what, what, air, what area we're looking at? So we left off in tier one. Okay, right. And I believe it was. 18. I believe, I believe it was 18. An item number? 18. 18. 18. Okay. And as far as the funding logs in front of you, uh, staff printed off an extra copy just in case you didn't have one available. Right. Okay. But the one you're using, there's a date on the lower left, and, and it should be September 1st. That is yeah. the most recent. Okay. Great. Thank, I, I appreciate having multiple copies. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm looking at the number that you're talking about. So, Thank you so much. Mike. Um, you let us off on last time and we we're on page five and we're discussing the differences between the CDCIP board and the mayor. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so the last one we went through was number 18. Um, 18 and 19 both match up with the request CDCIP and the mayor. Um, the, if you want to just move on to any discrepancies, it would be the next one would be uh, number 29. Uh, Mike, I'm sorry, Andrew and I were getting our packets when I think you might have said if there are changes between the packet we have now and last week. I don't know what you have now. I think if, it's something maybe from your office. If, if you are, if on your page you have a date that says 9 1 on the bottom left corner, last updated on the front page, yeah. that's what we're working right. off of. The, the sorry to interrupt. copies that you have at your place are, are the same. My apologies for the confusion. <laughs> so, so then number 29. If we go to, yeah, 29, this is the Sorensen Multicultural Center Gymnasium Sports Courts and HVAC. The CDCIP recommended that the full project be done. The mayor recommended that the uh, HVAC system, everything but the tennis, or everything but the basketball courts be done at this time and that we'd come back next year and finish the, the new courts. So this would be locker room improvements, HVAC, issues, et cetera. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chair? Um, yes. Is this the time? Uh, I'm wondering, is there cost savings if we do it all together, or is that a logical place where to break it out? Let me see. Let's check with Jim. Okay, thanks. And Mike, while we're uh, checking, um, if we're separating an application like this, um, it's not necessary for
for the Sorensen Center to reapply next year? Is it do we just carry it forward, or do we actually request that they reapply? They'd reapply, the, so we so make sure that reapply. it goes. The so the risk again. there is that they end up in the competitive cycle next year for a project that's currently in this year's cycle. It does. We do remind the board and the mayor that this was partially funded. So typically, we see those projects okay. funded in full of the next year. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, any efficiencies that would be per, that would be by doing the project all together would be split anyway, because the HVAC project would be done separately. The county would contract and and perform the work on the courts. I'm sorry. The county would perform the work on the courts, and they would contract that all out. Where the city would probably do the HVAC. So it would be two projects anyway. Any other questions on this item? Is that it? That's it. Council members, I'll just remind you that Mike's going through these where there are discrepancies. Uh, items that have been funded, but where there might be discrepancies between the committee's recommendation and the mayor's recommendation. Okay, Mike, thanks. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so that is the completion of tier one. Any differences? If you want to go to um, tier two, that's in tier two. Yep. So in tier two, uh, number three is the citywide traffic synchron uh, signal synchronization. The request was for a million. CDCIP did not uh, recommend anything for this, but the mayor did feel that it was important to get started and is recommending 300,000. And so what does that get us uh, toward that project, the 300,000? You know what? I'm it's my understanding that this Kevin was a pretty comprehensive it is. project, including some equipment replacement, software, and a whole host of things. What does the 300,000 get us? <clears throat> the 300,000 will get us looking at the area from approximately North Temple to about uh, 9th South, uh, I-15 to about 13th East. So the million dollars is a citywide, citywide request. This actually gives us a portion of the A city. portion of that, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess my, my, so that and wouldn't then, influence the rest of the city as far as synchronization if we just did the downtown area essentially? Um, uh, no, that, that yeah, it would only cover, we would be able to go in and look at those areas and make changes, but not in other areas. So I'm just thinking if we're talking about synchronization, if I'm going past Ninth East, I guess that doesn't sort of jive with the whole synchronization concept, I suppose, in a lot of ways, unless you're just looking at certain arterials um, and looking at those exclusively. Um, yeah, I mean, this gives us a benefit because we can look at this area and make uh, changes that need to be made to improve it. It just doesn't do to the out outlying areas as much as we'd like. I mean, they're still synchronized as much, you know, but there's tweaks that need to be made based on growth changes in traffic patterns, those kind of things. So we'll be able to do that more effectively in, in the area we're looking at. The other area we'll just, um, we'll have to wait or we'll, you know, when we have complaints, we look at it as well. But we're just not looking at the system as a whole outside the area I described. Is it safe to say that this is where our greatest concentration of signals are? Uh, if you're looking at downtown yeah, core? Yeah, it would be. And is this a manual synchronization or is this going to include some equipment upgrade? This does not include equipment. It's more um, program upgrade. And how does this correlate with our state roads? Um, we're tied into one system, so it help, it benefits everything. And we, as we do this, we would have to work with UDOT because they have a, a number of signals in the area I described, and we have to coordinate with them and make sure they're in agreement. If we propose changes on their roads, they would have to be okay. in agreement with that. More questions? I have one more. I'm going to try not to wreck stuff here. Um, if, we, if you had the entire million dollars to do this upgrade, would let me back up and say, if you get the 300,000 and mm -hmm. later you get the remaining 700, would the changes that you make with the f full funding um, 
affect what you would do with the 300,000? In other words, would we be causing duplicate work if next year or in the second year you get we, the total funding? Um, not necessarily. We're able to look at you know locations individually and not it doesn't have to be all or nothing. We can go in and do this area we're proposed, proposing now under the 300,000 and then we could go back and do the other area if more money um, becomes available. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, that is, <clears throat> that's everything for the tiered projects. The next discrepancies would be in the constituent applications. So that's towards the end of your log. And there are two projects there. There's number one, which is the sixth north, eighth west intersection safety improvements. The CDCIP recommended the full 80,000 be funded. At the time, the mayor did not recommend funding for this project. However, uh, since the recommendations were sent to the council, um, she has received more information and worked with Robin before she left uh, working for the city and were, they were able to come up with a, a, an, an alternative to this. So it would be a little bit less. So the amount would be uh, 35,000 and I believe that gets everything but the bulb outs. And just to remind the council, during the annual budget, you did include $80,000 specifically for this project. So it's been funded at the requested level. So, and that was my recollection too, that that is a uh, funding at a requested level that was a line item in the budget, right? Correct. So council members, this is fully funded right now uh, going forward. If we went to 35,000, we would be reducing funding and on this, but we would uh, be freeing up the remainder, the balance of that into the general fund, not into the CIP process, unless we moved it. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So the, the, full, the full 80 is what we're talking about here? The full, okay. the full 80 was funded yeah. by the council in the budget. Mm -hmm. um, so we did not fund it through our CIP competitive process. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, the final one is number 10, it's the Sugar House Park Roadway Maintenance. Uh, the CDCIP did recommend 82,500. The mayor did not recommend funding at this time, uh, primarily because uh, she felt that were, there were other road priorities right now uh, and chose to fund those instead. So Mike, could you go back to the 35,000 that the mayor identified for project number one? And if we don't use that, is that money available in the CIP competitive process based on the mayor's recommendation or was that additional funding from a different source? Sorry, say that one more time. Is so it available for you? It's available. Right, well, so it, it, the mayor, it's on the mayor's recommendation it doesn't in, does not include it. So it would not be in her total. Got it. So she's I balanced, think. but you certainly could change that any other project. She's balanced with that 35,000 not included. Correct. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. That means you. Can I take us back to number two in this section? The Whittier Elementary School drop-off pickup lanes. This is a project that has been done at uh, other elementary schools. I'm not sure if all of them have been done, but nearly. Um, that was generated by the school community and the community council in the area. If you've ever driven south on third east, uh, just, w just east of Slick, where Whittier Elementary is, um, what you don't see that you see at other elementary schools is a bus pullout lane. And where the buses park is immediately north of the only pedestrian crossing into the neighborhood on the on the, where the school entrance is and what it, what the community there has seen what i've seen as a parent there is that as the buses line up the only place for them to line up is essentially in traffic and cars in an attempt to get around them while they can't see the pedestrian crossing buzz around in oncoming traffic and through the pedestrian crosswalk not recognizing because the buses are blocking their view that they're they're putting kids lives in jeopardy so this was generated from um, concerned parents and neighbors and the community council in the area and um, 
it would you can read what it, it would do there, but it, it's pretty minimal. It wouldn't ch touch the sidewalk. It would take up some of the park strip there. And they have been working, uh, they've got the approval of the school district, and the school district may even take advantage of the construction if it were to happen to do some playground upgrades at the same time. Um, they could work together with the city in that, in that project. So I'm going to request that we fund this at $91,400. Um, and this is, this is something that should have been done a long time ago and that I wish the school district were participating in, but we have. Uh, and you know our rule, um, if you fund something, you need to identify where it's coming from. So do you have a funding source for it? I will. Okay. All right, so we'll just flag it for now. Thank the you. other thing that might be helpful in this process, and I don't know, Aaron, if this would work for you, is we might be able to split out the design and the construction, mm -hmm. because we might d do a design and then construction funding phase two, but it sound, it, at this amount, it feels like it probably ought to just all do it stay all. together. With the construction cost increases what they are, yep. I think be for more. this little amount, it would be, so I'll try to find all of that. Mr. Later. Chair, may I just, or Mr. Vice Chair? Yes. Make a comment on that. Um, this did come up in a previous discussion we had with the council, and so we looked into it a little bit. Um, there was 180,000 funded to Wasatch. Mm -hmm. um, however, that was used for a signal and not for the turnout. So the city has not participated in building a turnout for the, a vehicle turnout for any schools to this point. So did the school board pay for the Wasatch school? They, out. they must have paid for it out of yeah. their funds. Um, but the city pay, did pay for the tra traffic signal right by. Mm -hmm. So should we double the, the request and ask for a traffic signal instead of well, half of the request and do a pull out in our own property, which is the park strip? <laughs> so. I mean, it's a transportation <laughs> issue at its most basic. So I don't think it's in a, in an inappropriate request. I do wish the school district was participating and I'll be doing my ride along with the new superintendent next week and we'll be sure to bring this up yeah. with her. Even if they could participate at, at the partial level, that might uh -huh. get you going. Um, so here's what I'd like to do now, council members. Uh, if, if, Lisa, do you have a question about the specific one? Okay. Uh, well, on one that we just were doing when we talked about the Sugar House Park Road maintenance, um, my understanding was that that is a county responsibility. Is that? Um, there is a split between the county and the city. And the state, and the actually, state. yeah. Yeah, so I, um, I just wondered if, I mean, I know the mayor didn't recommend that, but I thought is, I wondered if that 82.5 is part of a three-way deal that the state and the county is doing something, um, or if we're just expected to do all of it ourselves. I know on the on the bathrooms there, it's been it's always been a split. A split. Mm -hmm. So just right, I think in the, in the past, um, it's not a, the state's not involved in any of the capital projects that go on in the park. But t there's been a historic um, understanding that the city and county split, although it's not in writing anywhere. So oftentimes, it's the city uh, asking the county to participate, allocating half of the funds, and then having the county contribute the other half. Um, oftentimes the park authority is really just um, going for the path of least resistance and so they'll oftentimes just ask one entity for the money even though it seems more equitable to ask two entities but the timing of the county's budget does not line up with the timing of the city's budget and so it's really complicated to get those two things to line up so um, maybe what we could do is ask um, the Sugar House Park Authority if this is the full cost of the project or if this is just one share if it's the full cost of the project, then in the past, when this has happened, the council allocates half of it and then makes a formal request to the county to allocate half, which oftentimes they're willing to do. So um, we won't, okay. we don't know I just want, we ask. want a little <laughs> more information about that. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So, so council members, what I'd like to do now is we've gone through all of the uh, funded uh, or even non-funded projects where there's a discrepancy between the committee's recommendation and the mayor's recommendation, so those have been highlighted. What I'd like to do now is uh, open up uh, uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions of Mike or other administrative staff about projects that maybe you would like to explore that ha were not recommended for funding, in particular any questions you may have uh, regarding um, what they entail or if there's perhaps a breakdown that we could fund partial uh, design and move forward. Uh, those sorts of questions. And then um, we'll be looking at um, uh, entertaining proposals um, for 
uh, closing out our CIP process. But again, I remind you that if you're looking to fund a project that's not recommended by the committee or the mayor, or even if you are by the mayor, then you need to identify where you're taking the money to fund that project. Um, at least give us some direction there. So uh, does that work for everybody? Can we just open it up for kind of general questions? Do you want to start at the top of the list and kind of go through those? And if you have one, we'll just kind of pause at it as we go. Um, so if we go to the first page, uh, actually we're, we're going to be into probably the second. Help me, Mike, with where it would start with unfunded projects. Uh, it would be all tier one. The first project is transportation safety improvements. Number one. So clarification, I'm, I'm not suggesting we recommend one funding or the other recommendation at this point. Right now, I just want to make sure we have all of our questions addressed about what you might be thinking you want to see funded, and then we'll go to looking at some recommendations. Yes, so uh, let's start with Andrew and then Aaron. Are we going in order then? Yeah. If we can, because I just think it'd be easier than trying to flip through so uh, pages. So starting on tier one, number one, is that where we're starting? Yes. You're tier one, number one? Well, I'm tier one, number three, but I want to know if we're starting there or if you want to skip over those. That's fine if you have some questions. So the East-West Community Connections uh, requested for 450000 never funded before, and no recommendation on it. Any information exactly the, the scope of that? I, I have a question because last night I met with an, another resident of, Glen, of um, Glendale about California Avenue, which is not directly a part of that corridor we're talking about, that rail corridor. Mm -hmm. Um, but is a major east-west connector that is um, not functioning properly at times. And so I'm wondering what the scope of this proposal would be and uh, the history of it a little bit. Sure. Why don't we have Kevin come up? He can, sure. He knows this project a lot better than I do. And Kevin, I'm sorry. Last time you were up, I didn't uh, ask you to introduce yourself. Could you just uh, let the TV audience know who you are? Okay. Uh, Kevin Young. I'm the interim director of the transportation division. So would you sure. ask your question again? That's fine. So uh, on number three, the East-West Community Connections uh -huh. uh, request for 450000 to study East-West Connections over the rail corridor specifically. Um, am I accurate in saying that's the extent of it, just that rail corridor, or is it other? No, it's looking at all East-West Connections, but the rail corridor and the freeway are the places where it's challenging to get across the city. And so we're looking at opportunities to study these connections and provide uh, better connections mainly for uh, cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, they're the ones where, you know, they're blocked by a train and sometimes those trains are um, there a long time and where you'll see a lot of cars, you know, turn around and they'll find another route for a pedestrian that becomes very onerous to um, either wait there for 45 minutes, you know, sometimes that could be the case. Um, and then or walk you know miles out of their way to get across that so we're looking at doing a study to look at these crossings and then um, in our application we want to pick a few locations as some demonstration projects to further flesh out and start looking at preliminary design of what could be done uh, and th these could range anywhere from you know minor changes to you know something big like um, you know bridges and things like that to get across What's the history on this proposal? How far back does it go? This is the first time. First time? Yes, this is the first time it's been proposed. Okay. I don't think so. Kevin, does that, would the proposal uh, look at the length of the corridor through the city? It was, is 450000 for that entire corridor from 21st South to wherever yes. north? Okay. We'd look at all of it initially as okay. part of that. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, Andrew? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Aaron. I'll, I'll ask a question on this number three, and then I have one on number one. Um, what this obviously entails some relationship negotiating with UP and other rail lines also possibly? Yeah, there's... Or are they uh, all owned by UP? Uh, mostly UP in the north-south uh, direction. And... Uh, cut our city. We've just succeeded at 
getting a bridge over UP line, right? Okay, we, we're getting towards getting a bridge. Um, is my safe to say that? Yes. Um, yep. To complete our uh, Jordan River Parkway trail. And that was a lot of work and a long, long time coming and probably some help from our federal representatives along the way. So I wonder how, if you can speak at all to that relationship in this context, because the reality of us against UP is, you know, a candle in the wind. Yeah. Um, well, I think on the Jordan River one, initially, I think there was a lot, it, it took so long and, it, it's, and we finally got where we're at because initially we were looking to it not be a bridge, that it could be an at-grade crossing. And that's where we had a lot of issues with the railroad. Um, once it became a bridge, um, a lot of that, there's still issues, obviously, with the railroad, but they um, softened a lot because they weren't going to be affected as, as much as an at-grade crossing. So on some of these, we're looking at, yeah, we're dealing with at-grade crossings as you're going. So, but they're existing. You know, the railroad can't right. deny us those because they're existing. So we'd look at ways to improve those. Um, okay, and, so hopefully the context of our current success with the Jordan River Parkway might lend itself to new conversations. New conversations, yes. Okay. And did you want to have a question on number one? Yeah, on the impact fees. Can you give me the context of that request on number one? where CDCIP, or I'm sorry, the request was of 80,000 impact fees, then we got a weird 53,000 number from CDCIP and a, a weird 49,778 from the it's mayor. It's 10% eligible. So whatever so, the total is, that, that impact fee amount is 10% of the total cost. Okay, so as our, our request reduced, it's just 10%. Yeah. Okay, and then? And under the current plan, any of those devices have to be used uh, on the, in the west side industrial area. And do you have, uh, do we have, do we know what the total available is of that road impact fee? The balance? Yeah, it would this be coming, would the transportation safety improvements be coming from that west side road impact fee fund? Right, the, the transportation is just one lump sum. Right. But, and any funding that come out of there, uh, any, any impact fee funding that comes out of there would just go to the west side industrial or northwest quadrant. I understand. I'm wondering oh, what the balance is of that fund. So the balances that I have and that are in the staff report are as of June 30th. Okay. And it's just over 7.2 million for the west side streets. And if any council members are interested, it's page 14 of the packet. Okay. And that is our, is that our only transportation fund, impact fee fund request in the CIP? No. No, there are others. Um, there's street improvements, 5th and 7th South. Uh, I'm just trying to pull these off the top of my head. Um, Gladiola. Gladiola. Except um, that's a lot more than 10%. Well, different streets have different percentages. Most street improvements are about 57%. And then uh, pedestrian safety devices, traffic signals are 10%. So can you jump to number 22 on Gladiola mm -hmm. and explain how the request was for 1.2-ish and, and in, is that in addition to 1.5 from impact to take it to 2.7? Yes. Check on that okay. real quick. <clears throat> Thanks, I'm, I'm figuring it out in my head. No problem. So that looks like that one is a, can access 57%. Mm -hmm. Is that what you got? Because that in is- In my head. In your head? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, 57%. And what is the total request? Is that down at the bottom, Ben, of um, transportation impact fees? So the impact fees in the funding log are not broken out by the four categories. They're just lumped together. And it's two and a half million for all the impact fees. Okay. So but if that's you wanted parks, that's pedestrian, that's roads, that's everything. Correct. So if we, I just want to make sure 
because we are getting better all the time at having impact fee conversations, that there aren't any expiring soon that we aren't taking advantage of in this request. There actually have been some refunds, but I don't know what the amounts are. We have some police coming up, which we may be able to think, we think we may be able to encumber for the um, crime lab. Uh, I've talked to John Bike today about that, so we're checking on that. Uh, that is, I think, our next one that's up for expiration. Um, Parks is at the end of 2018, um, but we have some that are coming up this fall, so we want to get... None in transportation. I can't remember off the top of my head when those are due, but we have, they're coming up soon. No. Okay, soon, but not now. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we're constantly... Jeff, will you, you are... introduce yourself? Sorry, I'm Jeff Snelling, city engineer. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jeff. <laughs> you're welcome. Sorry. Um, no, we're constantly in contact with um, finance on the expiration dates of the impact fees, and we're making sure that we're spending ahead of those expiration dates. That's what I want to hear. Yeah, and the, the other thing I just want to clarify real quick is our ratio of matching funds to impact fees for that west side industrial area, it's a factor of the additional width that we're providing. So the existing road has a certain width, so that 43% is like 43% of the ro new road, and we widen it this, you know, that much more. So we're more than doubling the width of the road. So that is how we're determining the ratio of impact fees to whatever our matching funds are. So that will vary depending on the type of road that we're looking at. But a study was conducted, you know, 10 years ago, and that was the ratio that was determined appropriate. So we were following through with that. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. So council members, do you have any additional questions on page one? Page two. Page three. And again, we're looking at the items that have, weren't either recommended by funding or that you perhaps want to explore additional funding for council members. So you'd have to make a recommendation. Page four. What about um, items that maybe you want to pull funding from for another project? Do you want to, uh, yeah, if you have a thought about that, it would okay. be worth uh, highlighting where you intend to do that. So, I have some questions about the Pioneer Park improvements. Could you say what number you're on? Number 15 on page three. I have it on page three of the most recent CIP log. The 472,000? Yeah, 472,500. Um, so I, I guess um, my question around the Pioneer Park improvements, I, I guess I'd like to have an update of where we're at with that because I know that we've been trying to explore this public-private partnership and I wasn't mm -hmm. sure exactly where that stands at the moment. Um, and then also I know we've been looking over the RDA budget and there is a million and some dollars set aside for Pioneer Park and I'd like to know how this proposal ties into the RDA request and how that ties into any private money that might be sitting on the table. So could I get you to introduce yourselves as you come to the table? Hi there, Lisa Schaefer, Public Services Director. Kristen Riker, Parks and Public Lands Director. Hello. Thank you and welcome. So the first part of the question I understood to be, what is the, how, where are we in the process exploring a public-private partnership? Uh -huh. And maybe uh, the first question should be the four hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars, and what is that? What's that intended to go toward exactly? Okay, so there was a master plan uh, for Pioneer Park that was approved, and the four hundred seventy-two thousand is the first phase of that uh, master plan. It's an implementation of opening up the center of the park, providing some hardscaping infrastructure uh, that. Um, uh, provides the backbone for the first phase of the of the project. Can, can I yeah. interrupt for just one second? Um, you're saying following up the master plan. Um, did a little research, and the master plan was never adopted. Oh, no. Only a few parts that, that were. Yeah, and that goes specific back to part of the master plan was never adopted. Yeah, that's specific. So I'm just wondering. 
Nancy? Nancy? <laughs> where, where, where we are on that. Sorry, I'm not, not trying to play a, a gotcha. I just... No, no, to totally if fair. If using a totally master fair. plan that was never adopted, we got a problem. Right. No, I, I hear you. So. And, and, and before I... And just to, when you answer that, if you could also address the concerns that I'm hearing from the community about historic trees being removed uh, sure. from this park. So before we do that, I think yeah. I just want to get a clarification from Jennifer on where we are in this process. Um, because uh, this uh, started prior to some council members who are currently on the council. So, um, Jennifer, could you sort of remind us? Um, and, and feel free to jump in because I'm sure that this is maybe what you were about to talk about. There was a design in, I think it was 2004, um, that was split into three phases. And I actually remember the first phase being split into three sub phases, and that that's what the council funded. It was landmark design engineering, I remember. I had have, yeah. um, Actually, the master plan was done by Design Workshop, and it was in right. 2004, and it was three phases. And the first phase was the improvements you see for the farmer's market. The second phase of this plan was to open the center of the park and create activities around the edges. Right, and that, I remember that phase specifically received a lot of council attention and mm -hmm. a little bit of controversy, and they did not feel comfortable adopting that phase at the time. Okay. And yeah. so they just adopted the first phase. Okay. And that, that is the reason why a, a couple of the charrettes were done in the last years to try and figure out, okay, how to address some of the concerns that were raised in that initial planning process. But nothing's ever been formally sort of officially been revealed as right. this is where we ended up after all those conversations. Yeah, and I don't know the intricacies of the city council approval process, only what was in the master plan. I do know that the Historic Landmarks Commission approved the big idea of the master plan. And in 2004? Yes. And all phases? Uh, I believe so. Okay. And in Check that, that. plan, um, was a very detailed description about all the impacts to existing features, existing trees, including numbers of trees and what trees may be preserved or which ones could be relocated. So um, there was a charrette last spring that was instigated because we had $300,000 for relocating the restroom. And so we felt we should relook at that. And so. So, uh, and I just want to highlight, uh, and this is not a criticism of the staff uh, in front of us because they're both new in their positions, um, but when, uh, from experience, when we have such a significant gap between the adoption of a master plan 2004 and the implementation 2016, mm -hmm. things have changed in that timeline. And so when you start to hear some resistance, it's probably because the people who adopted it and were around in the process in 2004 aren't around anymore, or the people you're hearing from today are new and were not part mm -hmm. of that process. So that is not uncommon when there's such a large gap. I'm not saying I have a solution for that, but it's part of what we have to figure out how to manage when we have that sort of huge distance between our uh, and, adoption and implementation. And, and I think to that, to that point, I think that's why the council typically relies on their, just their standard boring council process of public briefing, public hearing, mm -hmm. adoption, and that's what happened with the first phase of the master plan, but they deliberately decided to table the second and okay. third phases because they kind of, they couldn't mm -hmm. really, um, uh, sort out um, the the competing priorities sure. um, for the park. You know, all of the ideas were valid, but couldn't mm -hmm. really sort out which ones kind of fell to the top. So um, our our typical process would be a, a briefing, a proposal, a formal proposal. So if the Historic <coughs> Landmark Commission approves something, it'd be great to see that. And typically, that would get forwarded to the council, and then mm -hmm. the council would do their public hearing thing, and then people would come to the council and you know talk to the council about it, so that when they're asked for funding, they, they're aware of what the latest public thinking is on, on the plan, but I don't know. Well, and so I think we've sufficiently clouded this whole issue, um, but <laughs> I think what is identified is that we need to do a little bit of research about what actually was adopted at what level, sure. and so we need to go back and see what uh, the city council did and what the landmarks did. And, and, and to be clear, the city council doesn't always adopt uh, parks master plans. So um, we have, in some cases, we ha haven't in others, but. 
all of the, um, I would classify as like regional parks right. that mm -hmm. I can think of, the council has adopted a master plan of some sort. So um, I guess so. the question becomes, is this a regional park? And yeah. certainly the way we're using it more recently, mm -hmm. yes. In 2004, maybe not so much. So anyway, we need to get some sure. um, background done. And so Derek, um, that sort of, I just wanted to sort of lay out where we are for everybody so we're all kind of on the same page. Uh, thank you. Uh, as far as where this ties into the million and some that the RDA has and where we're at with the public-private partnership? Um, I can address the public-private partnership and it might be, the RDA money might be best left to you to discuss, is that fine? So the public-private partnership, um, we have been in discussions with the Pioneer Park Coalition for many months uh, preceding my involvement actually. And it's the kind of thing that I think is gonna take a little more time than this process uh, really is going to allow. And so uh, the discussions around a public-private partnership have really had, um, I think they're progressing. I think we're having some, some productive conversations, um, but we are not uh, ready to enter into an agreement or a partnership with anyone at this point. And by um, continuing to have those discussions, I think that the risk is that no funding will be allocated. It, it will kind of have the effect of stalling the funding allocation or the, our typical mechanisms for receiving funding for implementation of ongoing projects that we are trying to adopt in that park. And so it's, it's a little bit tricky for everybody involved. Um, but I think that nothing's off the table. We're talking to everybody. Um, we just want to do uh, make a little forward progress. Thank you. Is the RDA money allocated to some specific component of the no. project? Yes. And so um, the RDA has identified Pioneer Park as a priority for the Central Business District because it's a key element of that area and the success of the park and the success the district go hand in hand. And so um, as an alternative way to fund the phase that we are currently talking about, which is phase two of what we were talking about earlier, um, is opening up the center of the park, providing additional walkways, trees, lighting, a multi-use field. They would, the 1.7 that they have proposed to fund would accomplish all of those things with the CIP funding that we currently have in place of 300,000. Of how much? 300,000. So, 300, so we have current plus. funding of 300,000 that's from a prior allocation. Yes. We have a request for 472 and we have a 1.7 7. 7 from and that those three sources are what you're looking for for this one project. I would say we could do the 470, the 1.7 would be enough with the 300,000 to complete phase two. There you go. Okay. Well. <laughs> May I ask a, another question about it? So in, in terms of the RDA funding, who identified those as the priority things that we would spend money on there? Parks did, and did, public lands. Did parks and public lands did. And other than the charrette, what kind of a public process took place with that? Um, we attend the coalition meetings quite often. Not as op they're not as often now, but I've been involved with them since I've attended. And um, community council is there, neighborhood is there. Um, the, we had the workshop last February. Um, I think there's a general kind of consensus that removing the refuge areas out of the center of the park is a positive thing to do. Adding lighting is a positive thing. Adding new activities is a positive thing. So there's general consensus. And we do have some tabulation from a public uh, workshop, the one last February, that says what are the priority elements. And these reflect back to the community what they said. And the workshop was held as part of community council or just it was, a no, workshop it was, like? The other workshops we've it had. was a public open house workshop that we held in Big D so in the proximity of the park we mailed invitations to every resident in the neighborhood from a certain distance to right. and we had um, I think almost 100 people in attendance and it was about a third 
um, residents, a third social services, and a third local businesses. And um, we have shared it with um, various groups and they feel that it represents. In the right direction. Okay, thanks so much. I just think uh -huh. it's really important that we outline sure. that there has been a public process and yep. well, the road you've taken to get us here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lisa, Aaron. Hi, um, I'm all for improvements to this park and to, to lend my wrench to the one that stand through into it, I think trying to be constructive, but we know that this area desperately needs rejuvenation and analysis mm -hmm. of what we should do next in it. Also that change is coming for <laughs> that whole area. Um, and that I am really interested in a public-private partnership to the, to the Salt Lake City scale of the kind that we saw in Chicago on the chamber trip last year. Um, with that being the location for the Twilight Concert Series and knowing what, or what's kind of capable of um, ho what we can host in that park, I think while we can't put a p giant parking lot that's in high demand underneath Pioneer Park like they did in Chicago to get a lot of funding mm -hmm. from it, um, we can, there is, we've shown that there's money generation capability and that we can host many, many people in that area. Mm -hmm. That said, I'd like that carried into the public-private partnership discussions. And I hope that the tier of people when we get to that RFQ or RFP stage is of that Chicago level, that we're way beyond local business owners. They can be included too, but this is, a, this is our downtown mm -hmm. park. Mm -hmm. and its potential is great. And then I'm thinking of impact fees and the 100% that we can fund when we buy property. And I'm thinking, um, just to throw it out there, about how we might be able to sell this property from parks and public lands to s perhaps some other department of the city. Um, I don't know what we, what we can contemplate doing in order to make a new park at Pioneer Park you can laugh, man, but this is not <laughs> a bad idea. Could we, could we do that? You know, How can we transfer this property if we're in the process eventually of a public-private partnership so that we can make a new park and be able to access greater funding capacity by doing that? Even if it is you know, a piece of the park and we own another piece of the park. Or, I don't know what that looks like, but I'd love for your minds to noodle on that as we march towards a totally different future. Um, and I'm hesitant to go ahead with the 2004 plan for what is a really different area now and what will be a really different area in five years, even from today, so. So Mike, one of the things I, um, uh, I, think, uh, I think I know the answer, but I'd like an official answer. If you could uh, communicate to our impact fee consultant or however that needs to get back to them. Um, Impact fees are for increasing capacity. Um, what flexibility do we have in the definition of how we increase uh, capacity in an existing park? And is that even an option for us? Um, do you already know that answer? Well, on, on the current plan, the, um, the one thing that was done was every park was looked at and, imp and improvements were identified. And then the impact fee eligibility was also included. So if you look, you look through the impact fee plan, it'll go through every single park and tell you what's there. I don't believe Piner Park has anything that's eligible right now, which is, I mean, that's not, that's not a good thing. But um, as, you, as he explains this new plan to you, there is much more flexibility in what is being proposed so in the park. I'm so maybe intrigued. something in the future. I, but I, to be clear, I think that one thing that he's, because um, we've asked a lot of creative financing <laughs> questions, and one of the things that he has answered is you can't purchase city property with impact fees. Right. But maybe making improvements to add different services uh, to service the new people who will live in the area. Right. So I think so, that's the hook for impact fees, not necessarily the property. So fees. for so. example, it, and I'm not, I don't think we're quite ready to have everybody have sign off on the activity fields. However, if, you're, if we suggest that there's a, de a new demand for more people to access this park, and one of the solutions we propose is activity fields that could be highly scheduled, mm -hmm. is that impact fee eligible? And so it seems like there's some capacity elevation there. Right. And, and a, a similar question came up regarding uh, Fairmont Park by the peanut board who said if we added 
uh, lights for soccer, would that be impact fee eligible? And my initial reaction under the, under the current plan was to say no, but as we looked into it um, under the proposed plan, it would be because you're, you're expanding that capacity, that ability for more people to attend the park. So I think with what he's proposing in the new plan, there will be more flexibility and those okay. kind of things can be done. That would be good to know. Any additional questions on this, Derek? So I just um, want to make sure for I For an item, I, I'm amazed how much time we're spending on an item you're going to propose that we yank from funding, but um, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, so what I was going to make sure that I understood correctly was that with the 300000 that we've already got set aside plus the 1.7 proposed in the RDA budget, you don't need the 472 in order to move forward with phase two. Correct. We need about $2, two million to do the phase total. two. And looking at creative funding solutions and all the options that may be available, we wanted to explore all of that. Okay. So I would suggest that we go back and say there might be there might be existing funding to to fund that phase, and also we should explore that impact fee eligibility because I think we can do that pretty quickly in this process. Yeah. So I guess my proposal would be to pull the funding from Pioneer Park on this CIP log. So hold that thought. Okay. Okay, and we'll come back to it. So any additional questions on, uh, we're on page three. I well, do. After you, Aaron. Thank you. On number 16 on the next one, um, the mayor's proposal of 159 after the CDCIP request of 400 leaves us short, I believe, just $41,000 in order to meet the match need of 296. Is my math wrong? My math might be wrong on that one. Um, receipt of the approved STP funding is contingent on a required minimum local government match of 296,000. So 141. We need 141. Mm -hmm. Am I right there? To meet the match. Uh, I apologize, um, council member. I didn't hear the entire question, but I'm assuming we're talking about 13th East and That's matching correct. funds. Okay. That's yeah. correct. All right. So we made a request for 400,000 right now as a partial match for that project. Um, in 2011, um, engineering put in an application to Wasatch Front for $11.1 million to improve 13th East from 1300 South to 2100 South. We received $4.052 million. Um, and at that time, they said the city would have to come up with that difference. So in the meantime, um, Robin and I worked with Wasatch Front, and it appears we're going to get $2 million more dollars that will be actually available at the same timing as the original $4 million to um, do the project. So that leaves us with a minimal match amount of five by million. federal standards, right? But we also have a gap to take care of. And so we've relooked at the project from that original 2011 estimate. The project estimate now, I believe, is 10.1 million. It went down. We brought it down. We reevaluated wow. that original estimate. And then we're also looking at some value engineering, some different techniques for paving the road to help bring those costs down further. And so that will occur as far as, as far or as part of the environmental documentation. And so we're looking at moving forward on that process in this coming year with the um, intention of actually having the construction in 2018, 2019. So answer my question again. Are we short 141,000 with the mayor's uh, proposal of 159,000 right now? Right. Are we shy of our need for the match? Right. So, to, so give me some. And numbers, I apologize. With, if you can, with the um, we're required as a minimum match to come up with six point seven seven percent of the appropriation from Wasatch Front, which is two hundred ninety six thousand. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So we are short in that regard. However, those matching funds, do, we don't have to have those available immediately they can be part uh, or they can come as we are moving the project forward and at the time of when we're actually looking at doing construction and full design. 
So I would anticipate that we have another year to come up with those minimum matching funds, and then we'll also have to address the gap in the meantime. And the gap is about four million right now at this time. However, okay. we're hoping to bring with that, that gap with additional down. engineering, you may be able to re reduce right, that. Right, and looking at some new paving and, techniques. And so, are you, you telling me don't try to find the remaining match not money right now this year? Really? I th <laughs> if we can find it, that's fantastic. However, I don't think it's required at this time. It doesn't stop front, the project from moving okay. forward. Right, we Thanks can still okay. move ahead with it. Okay. So. I'll stop trying to find it then. Oh, thank you. Thank, it's Additional questions? We're on page three. Andrew? Uh, page two, number eight, the Glendale Irrigation Multipurpose Field. Do we have a breakdown of what the costs are for the irrigation versus just removal of the turf, et cetera, and then the cost savings of the irrigation upgrades for our water usage? Yeah, let me just pull this application out and see if it's... Kristen may have it. Do you have the breakdown? Breakdown for the Glendale. Glendale irrigation. I don't have a cost breakdown. Uh, we just have the, the systems that are included in, in the price, which mm -hmm. is um, a central control irrigation system, backflow controller, heads to meet the cur current irrigation standards, and um, um, let's see. Yeah, and that's all. I think the irrigation and the field kind of go hand in hand. Okay. Any sense of the water savings? Based on the upgrade? Right now, we're not watering Glendale for the most part, so there may not be savings. We'll probably be watering it. It's very yellow if you've been out there because the irrigation yeah. system just flat out doesn't work right now. And uh, Charlie? So, the irrigation system that you're putting in, is it going to be compatible with secondary water? It'll be culinary. It, it, so, I know it'll be culinary, but um, will the system itself, that we're, the new system, be compatible? Uh, if we were to switch to secondary water at some point, um, would the system be able to handle uh, that conversion or would there be an additional cost um, for that conversion? It's a good question. I think that um, it wouldn't be compatible because it would, it would, would not. not. Okay. Um, because you need um, what they call the dirty heads for the water to, to come through so it doesn't get so restricted, which is the problem we're having right now at Liberty Park, uh -huh. um, watering the park with secondary water. They didn't put on those um, specialized heads for the secondary water, and so we're having issues with the heads out there. So I would say this is probably not compatible for secondary. Okay. So um, I think there are two questions. This was not recommended by the mayor, so if the council uh, wants to fund this, uh, we'll have to identify additional funding for it, and we may want to get some uh, information back about secondary water options and with how it would that increase the cost. Sure. Also, get that. questions about the replacing the entire sod if, we're, if it dies off. That's what it's doing now uh, for the okay. entire field. Okay. Is that correct? I Can think we'd want to evaluate the condition of the sod. It's, as Kristen said, the irrigation right now is subpar and we've really had a hard time keeping things alive and yeah. sometimes the replacement um, when you're in there working on all of that it's the sod is probably negligible compared to the installation of the mm -hmm. but we can come back with more information so that'd be great if you could communicate sure, that with thanks. ben that would be very helpful thank you uh yes um just one other uh, one other point one and it's not just about this but i you know, I think any time we're looking at um, pricing for a new irrigation system, um, one of the things that I'd be very interested in looking at is, um, you know, having the 
costs for a compatible system um, because if we uh, continue to do what we've talked about as a council over the past few years, which is looking at, at alternative uh, sources you know, and, um, for irrigation, I would hate to spend a lot of money on a new irrigation system that is un that's, that's non-compatible that we're going to have to go back and, and completely fix. So even if it's a little bit more expensive, I'd rather do it right, even if we're going to be on culinary for the next couple of years, knowing that um, we have that c capability later. Yeah, great. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to go to item number 17 on page three. Uh, Aaron had a question about that one. Yeah, the class C 2.4. Would that class C money be available for the Whittier request? I don't know if class C can be used for the Whittier. Which is the design and construction in our lanes of traffic. Just not knowing the specifics of um, what is needed at Whittier to accomplish that. If it is within the public way and if it's just altering the curb and gutter moving sidewalk, then that would be alterable. Then I'm going to propose that that analysis be done um, after our meeting and ultimately I'm going to hopefully be able to propose that we take that 91 thousand from the 2.49 million in class C which will still leave our street improvements budget over four million dollars okay. okay so you'll be getting back right okay thanks okay. Jeff um, we're on um, page four council members any questions on page four items you're you need clarification on if not, we'll just move to page five. Any questions on page five? I'm going to move page six. Page seven. Eight. Maybe I should do this. <laughs> Are there any questions about any other projects? I do want to look at number two on tier two, the north, uh, third north pedestrian bike overpass. It's on page six. Number two on all tier two projects. I know we've talked about the third north um, overpass of the railroad tracks before, but I'm a little confused about if we have other funding sources identified previously. Kevin, do you have any additional information? This is part of that uh, Tiger Grant proposal, uh, 300 North, and uh, it's looking for uh, 300,000 for a matching component from the city. Do you have additional information about that? <laughs> I'm looking, Mike. Um, it's, it gets very complicated, and Mike may have to jump in and correct me or see your others. Um, because we have two projects here, one is we were looking for funding from Wasatch Front Regional Council, and then now this is tied in with the Tiger Grant. And, and so is, a UTA mon is UTA leading the Tiger Grant? Yeah, UTA is the one who submitted for it, and it involves a number of agencies in this area, and so it's very complicated on how they're now going to go about um, Figuring so, it all out, how it's going to be done. So is it safe uh, to assume that we're not quite sure what the city's role would be this year and that's maybe why the mayor didn't recommend it and that we'll be looking right. at this again? Correct. We don't know the exact dollar amounts yet, nor do we know the timing. Okay. Um, yeah. So we are waiting for that and then we, we've looked at some different scenarios of ways to do that using Class C or impact fees. Some of it also depends on what the... Um, what's adopted in the new impact fees facilities plan. There may be some funding there as well for some of these projects. This is certainly so it's a certainly a pedestrian little bit of a and bicycle and improvement. Mm -hmm. right. um, the mm -hmm. good news is there's a Tiger Grant um, for news. this, so yeah, it, it provides most of the money for this right. project. Okay, does that answer okay. your question, Jennifer? Yes, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Any additional questions? So council members, uh, this wraps up our conversation on the CIP. Next time we'll be looking at this is the fourth. And what we'll be looking for is a very specific recommendation from you about what you might want to add 
in the way of funding for projects and where you've identified the source for that funding. Um, and uh, uh, if you have any additional questions as you're working with that process, I would uh, strongly advise you to talk to Ben and to potentially Mike before that meeting because we won't have a lot of time in that meeting to ask questions. It'll really be all about making recommendations. So be, uh, does anybody have a proposal now? I hadn't thought about that. You have a few? We have a little time. Does anybody, is anybody prepared to make a uh, initial proposal or some partial proposals? I'm sorry, I, we, had, both, I, we have more both, time than I thought we did. You need both ends, right? You need both, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet, though. Is my proposal formal enough? Uh, uh, remind us it of again? it, remind us of it, yeah. Um, pending approval mm -hmm. that I'm trying to flip to the Whittier project. So I can just repeat what I heard. 11. The yeah. $91,400 request for Whittier Elementary Lane reconfiguration, the money be taken from the Gladiola Street Class C one-time funding. No. Nope. Oh, Street Improvements. From number 17, Street Improvements, Reconstruction, okay. Pavement Overlay and Preservation. I really feel like this project falls within what those number 17 is capturing and it, that it's a critical safety need for that community. So. Uh, so, uh, as clarification, uh, Councilmember Mendenhall is making a proposal that we take it out of those road improvement funds and we fund that project, although we need to confirm that it's actually eligible. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. So, if you're supportive of that, thumbs up. If you're not, thumbs down. Looks like we're unanimous, so thank you. Any additional proposals? Lisa. Uh, this actually is not a proposal, just to have no, this was not funded or anything, but interesting point, uh, constituent project number seven, the Berkeley Street reconstruction. Um, they want, half the street is concrete to their block and then it is not. And uh, I talked to the constituent who was interested in it and when I told him that um, if they ever need to do sewer improvements that it would like be four times the price of asphalt, they said they would be happy to withdraw that. So they asked for it. They're no longer asking for it. Too bad it wasn't funded because then we would have 266,000 to use. Okay. But, but I think it's just worth, it was a good lesson for me to learn the details about it so that I could go back to the constituent and say, here's why this wasn't funded and are you aware of this? And I think sometimes it's good for us to recognize that projects that sound really great um, for our neighborhoods sometimes end up not being as great as we hope. And so I'll take that opportunity yes, to thanks. remind people that Councilmember uh, Mendenhall has suggested that we might want to explore some options for assisting people who need to do a sewer work in a concrete uh, road base. Because we have shifted to concrete in a lot of situations because it's more durable, but it significantly increases cost, so. Mr. Chair, thanks. may I just add a comment to that? Yes. Um, the, you've heard about the Road Selection Committee that meets to review roads uh, um, proposed by transportation engineering. And uh, when we met on, on these roads, Berkeley was actually approved as one of those to do. So that is being done, as is Normandy Circle, which is also on the CIP log. So those two projects are being completed. Yeah, and they'll start next year. Okay, uh, Derek. Are you ready? I'm ready, yes. Okay. So um, just looking at the Pioneer Park improvements that I already suggested we pull. Um, so I, I, I would recommend that we pull that 472, 500. Um, and I would actually like to shift that to another place in District 4, which is number eight on page 12 under constituent requests. This is the um, green median on 1200 East. It currently already exists between, I think, 4th South and Second South or so, um, and this would be to continue that according to the East Central Community Master Plan. Uh, this part of uh, District 4 has uh, been very well organized and they're very passionate about this green space. Um, if you make your way up to 1200 East, you'll see that our exceptionally wide streets on uh, 1200 East are actually larger because of angled parking that the um, park strip, our park strip are angled parking, so it feels even larger. So there's a real desire to um, 
get this green space in an area of the t of Salt Lake that we don't have a lot of access to green space, but also this would help with the um, heat island. Uh, this area, if you go there, you know, anywhere between 11 in the morning and 6 o'clock at night, it just, it's just like 10, 15 degrees hotter. Um, this would help a lot, and I would like to shift that money to this project. Questions, Aaron? Yeah, how much is the asphalt overlay component of that? Jeff, do you have a breakdown on the, because in, in our information, it's got the project to put in the medians, but then I also highlighted that it includes an asphalt overlay on the section of 1200 East. And I don't know if the asphalt overlay is included in the 533 or if it's look, we're looking at road funds to do that. I apologize, I, and I do not know the specifics of this project. However, you don't know every I, single <laughs> thing. I apologize. <laughs> um, however, we do have a lane mile cost for overlays, and again, I, I just would need to look into it. So, could we find out on that can. one? Yeah, thanks. Yes. Because the transfer is a little less than this request, so I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think I out. see where you're going, Aaron, that we might, if it's actually a, a part of this project, we might want to look at a little bit of that road improvement money to finish off that amount. Um, if, it's a, if it's additional money that's not included in that fi uh, 533, we're a little short. Yeah. Thank you. So um, any other questions about uh, Councilmember Kitchen's proposal? Any, all those who would support that, let's do a thumbs up and oppose. That's unanimous. Oh, one, uh, Andrew, is a thumbs down. Okay. I have other ideas for the money, too. <laughs> okay. Same amount. Thanks. And could you get that information back to us, when you know, back to Ben, so we, we know for sure if, if we're short on Definitely. that one. Definitely, yes. And any additional proposals, council members? So I had a question, uh, and going back to Andrews, it's a this 300 is, North this pedestrian. This is weird that I have to call on you. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, um, the Tiger Grant, if you go to page 12, new projects, we show the request of 1.2 million for the Tiger Grant match, and the mayor's funded that 1.2 million. So does that take care of that project? Will you tell me which one? I don't know which page. So if page you go to page 12, time. it's new projects, and it's the UTA Tiger Grant match. Is this, is this the new one? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a new project. Okay, all right. So on the Tiger, on the Tiger um, Grant, a proposal was sent from the mayor's office as just that, a proposal looking at this once we know the funding. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier, what the funding may be and the timing on that. We don't know that right now. And so I think it's best if we wait to see what those amounts come in at and then revisit this, maybe through a budget amendment. We also may be able to use uh, impact fees um, as well. So, so the, it, it, hmm. it doesn't look that there's any revenue identified for that $1.2 million, is that? It would be a matter of switching some, some Class C or maybe impact fees or general fund around. To, so to in this proposal, and I have a question about whether or not this carries through in the balance. So we're looking at a, a new funding project. It's 1.2 million. I don't see uh, funding sources identified. So in the mayor, they? sorry to interrupt. In the mayor's revised recommendations, she did that recalibrating right. to use general fund money for 1.2 million for this project, and. During that process, uh, funds were used in one-time Class C for Gladiola street improvements and a couple others. Including this one, or is it out? Not in, only general fund, 1.2 million for the UTA Tiger Grant match, but the recalibration uh, that the mayor did used the 3.75 million in one-time money to make some of those changes. Okay, so I guess um, the additional question would be, why are we separating out a CIP application match for that for $400,000 and then the $1.2 million? Can we combine those both? And Let, I get that we yeah. don't have actual numbers yet. Can we, on the fourth, can we have more of that discussion? We'll get get that put together That'd a little be better great. for you. But I think it really it's 
it's if we need to, how do we come up with a 1.2 and still try to get these other projects done? Okay. So looking at what's eligible in Class C and impact fees, okay. that will help us. But my sense is that we'll be looking at that as a general fund budget amendment and not a CIP funded project. Is could that be, but accurate? it could affect but it could affect CIP projects. Right. If it comes if out we of decide class to, C. Right. Okay. You may choose to fund some of the CIP projects out of the class C. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Mike. Chair. Yes, Lisa. Because we have a little bit of extra time, I, I'm just looking on the under the CAM projects. Um, number three on the cemetery critical infrastructure. I'm um, looking that over since the 2012-13 year we've appropriated 1.2 million um, for the cemetery. The request is 19 and a half million. So are we doing anything with that, that, that 1 million? I mean, that's, that's such a discrepancy between what's requested and what we've appropriated. Can we do anything with that? And, and no one recommended giving any money to that. Is it because dead people don't vote or what's the deal? Well, if, well <laughs> dead people don't vote. Well, that Only depends. In my last election, I think <laughs> actually a lot of them did. Um, <laughs> Just don't even go there, Stan. <laughs> um, I do know that the that total request is a multitude of projects, uh, including everything from street, curb, and gutter, restroom, uh, walls, um, and that we are in the process of actually this year doing a, several of those projects, but pieces of them, not the whole thing. So we are in process with the cemetery master plan, which will drill down deeper into how we prioritize all of the As needs. As it were, drill down deeper. Yes. <laughs> not, not more than double deep. Um, the $19 million represents an estimate that Salt Lake City Engineering put together for the total cost of deferred maintenance. There's nine miles worth of roads that are probably the one thing we hear the most about from the constituents that they're um, going almost beyond repair. And so just the cost of those nine miles of roads is close to $19 million. One of the things we're trying to do in the master plan is um, really look at the road network and say, you know, pri primary, secondary, tertiary, and then look back at how, what do they really need to be? Can they be a little narrower? Can they be Not a different surface? <laughs> right. So to figure out how we can make it achievable, because I think it's such an overwhelming amount that it's hard to even. Hmm. So some, that 19 million is only streets. It's not. I think curb no. And it was and all bathrooms. deferred maintenance. It was all it's deferred all maintenance. Streets Walls. and curbs and. Walls and. All, all of that and, stuff. So yeah. okay. I just, but because it just concerns me a little bit if we aren't giving any funding um, that we just get farther and farther behind. That, Correct. And, and it's, <laughs> I just happen to pick yeah. cemeteries, but parks, it's yeah. the same thing. Streets is the same thing. Mm -hmm. But that just is such a giant number as you go through these numbers that I just was, and my I, eyeballs popped. Um, Kristen, and previously we had put together sort of applications or historically that seem to be in fundable chunks, but we wanted to be very clear about what the real need so was. So we can see. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that too. So yeah. so that 1.2 million is a portion. being utilized mm -hmm. to move us yes. a little bit more. Okay, thanks and so much. Christian, remind me, I know that we did a lot of assessment of the rock walls and the 11th Avenue wall and even some interior walls. Some of those are actually getting repaired now, aren't they? Yes. Yes. So, so some of that has been funded, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I think we just need an update on where we are. And we just completed the N Street restroom that provides yep. service both. And to it's very nice, by the way. Good. <laughs> it's for the cemetery as well as for the fuel station. So it's open 24 hours for all of the city staff that use that fuel station. Yes, Aaron. Two things. Um, is it being considered that perhaps some of the tertiary? identified roadways could become pedestrian pathways? Um, I think we're open to everything and we're gonna filter that through operations and maintenance. But I think we would like to consider that. I, I think 
thinking just to the conversation we just had with Jeff Snelling about 13th East and the way mm -hmm. that there's this big number and then they think really creatively. Mm -hmm. Even over time when yes. I expected Jeff to say, actually the cost increased because we analyzed it years ago and costs <laughs> go up, so that it's gone down. Mm -hmm. um, that I would be really interested in hearing those kind of creative approaches yep. to reducing our lane miles, our so uh, roadway street miles. miles. In, in conjunction, yeah. um, one of the conversations I think that the parks is looking at is what does the cemetery become when it's when it's filled as well, a cemetery and mm -hmm. and many other models uh, mm -hmm. nationally look at a very significant yes. shift to parks and open space, which would really make sense to accommodate mm -hmm. paths rather than roadways and mm -hmm. so th making that distinction between access uh, for burial and access to visit I think yeah. is a really and perhaps not just pedestrian pathways, but maybe we increase capacity at the cemetery. I know that that's reaching a limit. Yes. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, if any of you haven't taken the tour up at the cemetery, it is so worth it. And of course highlights this need to very, very clearly. Um, and it, but you can also find out sometimes where some great horned owls are nesting yeah. and that's and pretty cool. Great. It's a secret. Well, that, <laughs> that's the other part. There's a historic component and have yeah. any other historic cemeteries in the state ever accessed historic preservation dollars for these kind of mm -hmm. retaining walls and whether or not streets can be used. The Lemp we Adams are going to look at all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest the timing is perfect for the haunted cemetery tour and they have one so um, I'm sure they'd be happy to accommodate. We, there's several good tours up there. Yeah. But I, would, I just have to trip. chime in. I like the idea of the pedestrian friendly stuff, but as someone who goes to just an amazing number of funerals, you'd think it was my hobby, but that's when you have parents of a certain age, that's you take your parents. It is so difficult to get old people mm -hmm. to graveside mm -hmm. services and that kind of thing. Um, when there isn't a road that's accessible and mm -hmm. the ground is unsteady and it's um, right. it, it's 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 tricky and someday when it's full maybe it's not such a problem. That's but not yeah. far. That's actually not far away. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, it's, and, yeah, I, and it's not that far off. Yeah. I think the what we're hoping with the master plan is that it presents all of those issues and opportunities and really provides an opportunity for people to kind of prioritize how those things are um, accommodated. Uh, I could talk about the cemetery all okay. day, Sorry. but I do I want to uh, 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 see if there are any additional questions or proposals as part of the CIP process. I have a question, Stan. Council okay. Member Rogers. Um, item number 14 on page three. I'm sure you've already gone over it. The pickleball courts in Jordan Park and Liberty Park, because everyone loves pickleball courts. My question is, there is the mayor's funded or proposed funding for 300000 Where will that money be used? In which park? And how many pickleball courts will that really give? Come back up, Nancy. <laughs> it's just for Liberty. It's just for Liberty Park? Yes. So we did put the CIP application for the two areas, and it was advanced for Liberty Park. And is there a reason why this wouldn't be going to Jordan Park than it would be for Liberty Park? That was the mayor's um, recommendation. She wanted to focus on Liberty and... Is it about, um, so it looks like it's about the same cost either right. one. There's a little bit more, if we're looking at a split, it would be a little more cost to Jordan. Is that new construction or is it... You know, I think in both cases um, we have selected areas, but we haven't done enough construction document sort of analysis to understand the true cost. So it's, it's um, in Liberty Park, it would be for new construction. And at Jordan Park, there was, I think, some repurposing and some new. Could you do something for us sure. as a follow-up? And I, I, I well, think maybe I'm going to propose to move the money, Stan. Okay. Well, then, never mind. <laughs> I was going to suggest that um, uh, a, an assessment of the distribution of pickleball across the city would be really helpful. My sense is it's primarily east side, um, so. We have a map. We can share with that. Yeah, That'd be great. Um, mm -hmm. And that being said. I think uh, the, 
with pickleball until we see that map. I would actually look that we move item number 14, the pickleball courts at Liberty Park to uh, item number 11, which is on page two, which would be for Riverside Park field lighting for the Rose Park baseball diamonds in the uh, Riverside Park area. And the reason being is that they have, this is one area where baseball is huge on the west side and uh, there's, no, there's no lighted baseball fields in, in, mm -hmm. on the west side. And uh, this is a constituent application from, uh, from uh, the, the league as well as other, other events that would be held there. So I'd look for support from council members in, in moving that funding over to there to fund those and, and light those two fields. I'm so disappointed. I thought you wanted pickleball on the west side. <laughs> it's a pickleball um, there. We learned earlier when you were not with us that lighting may be an impact fee eligible um, Ex on the expenditures new so on the new plan, on the new new plan. plan. so uh, before we take this vote could we get some feedback on that and clarification to confirm that mm -hmm. and but so we highlight that Ben just so I don't forget next mm -hmm. October 4th but does that provide funding not this not, year you know, this so year. so the impact fee plan has to be in place and Mike can correct me but it has to be in place before we can spend impact fees in that way and and I think it even applies to like the 90 day waiting period that goes into effect once what the about council adopts collection so if we have uh, if we have a current uh, balance of impact fee money and we have a new adopted plan those can, can be spent on those can be spent so so I just wanted to pitch that out there because we could still potentially get it in construction next year it just might be, be a little bit delayed if, if that is you know something we can do i'm in favor of it so let's get a clarification on that and then hold your vote for yep. next time that's that's Chair, okay um, yes well, while we have nancy here and we're talking about pickleball i i want to keep bringing this up yeah. but um can we find out how much it costs to just do pickleball lines on regular tennis courts and and propose that as we're going through and resurfacing courts that we maybe think about that and I know that the nets aren't as high but it's sure. still it's still kind of a nice alternative and multi-purpose use of mm -hmm. some tennis courts mm -hmm. that and, and my understanding is that there's been funding to put pickleball courts at Fairmont Park well there is funding for tennis courts. for tennis we have design funding and implementation funding for two tennis courts in Fairmont Park we have submitted a budget amendment, which I think you've seen, which would allocate the funding instead for pickleball courts. And we are um, proposing that it is single use because we've heard from both of those user groups that they prefer single use. Right. One of the things we're doing is in the design of the pickleball, you can fit, if you're. You can fit it, six courts six where to there are two tennis courts. Yes, so yeah. because we're. So if we move forward with this, we can do sort of the post-tension concrete foundation that is two tennis courts or eight pickleball. We could do the eight, either one, the eight pickleball, and if pickleball were to die into the future or not be as popular, it's really easy to go back. What I've heard is from the user groups is that it's really difficult. It's easier to go that direction than the other direction? No, you can go either, either direction. Okay. And I would say that the dual painting is a nominal cost that could be incorporated. And then if given that the tennis court surface is in good condition, it's fairly straightforward. I don't have the exact, exact, yes. exact cost, but it's not um, prohibitive. Uh, so, if we were to develop either tennis or pickleball, we can do the footprint so that it could easily go back and forth based on demand and um, while still providing either both or single use. But it's difficult, I think the reality of day-to-day -day dual use, it's a difficult thing to balance. One other comment that I've heard about Fairmont Park, whether it's tennis or pickleball, uh -huh. is having it so close to the off-leash dog area um, that people, when they're playing tennis, don't like barking dogs, and that maybe it's not really compatible to have those by each other. I don't know how pickleball players feel about it, but um, um, I know we, people who are really noisy when they play tennis, right. especially when they don't do well. Right. I, like, <laughs> not from personal experience or anything like that. You know, I didn't, I heard the same comment from the tennis players as well. Not from them, but 
by way of it, and we asked our Utah Pickleball Association if, it, if the dog park would bother them, and their quip was they're hard of hearing. So they said <laughs> they're, they're, they would be happy to have courts anywhere. And one of the reasons we're advocating for pickleball is the community really wants to activate the southern part of right. the, the park. And if you have eight pickleball courts, four players per court, 32 players versus two tennis courts, four to eight max. And so there is a demand that we haven't met. And we do have senior living coming yes. to Sugar House yes. next spring. Yes, and Boys and Girls Club would right. like to also Could use, use the pickleball. Too. It okay. sounds like you've thought of okay. all those things. Thank you. All right. Uh, Andrew um, has a question, and then I'm going to wrap well, this up. Cause proposal, we're, uh, actually. A proposal, This goes okay. back to, to Derek's proposal earlier, and I'm, I'm not... I'm not putting down the proposal at all, but I had um, desire to look at uh, the Tier 1 proposal for number uh, the East-West Connections. It's $450,000 for a, an analysis, essentially, um, of those connections, and it doesn't take the entire 472 that we are not going to allocate potentially to uh, Liberty Park. I'd like to see us use some of that on, on that uh, East-West Connections um, study. Pioneer Park, excuse me. Pioneer Park. Uh, the rationale for me is that it, it's the it's probably the major <coughs> barrier for both economic development on the west side, um, and touches on <coughs> districts five, four, um, and one and two, and it hits a lot of us that way. It also touches on I think California Avenue, which is um, having some uh, with the with the new changes over there having some additional problems as the arterial going east west. So I'd like to see us address that if we could. Mr. Chair, and I'm just wondering. <laughs> Because it's a plan or, or you're looking at it, would that be impact fee eligible? Uh, I don't believe this one is. Have uh, you have mentioned on the plan? Another opportunity that yeah. I'm thinking it might have is that at least a portion of a depot in North Temple are, uh, fall within RDA districts. Mm -hmm. And so we may be able to get a portion of it started through some RDA funding. Um, so, so, West why, Hill Hill too. so why don't we get, yeah, yeah, West Capitol Hill, although that's restricted. So oh, that's right. why don't we uh, get some feedback as to what perhaps we could get started with an RDA funding component, if not the entire length of the city, but initially mm -hmm. getting it started. I'd be open to cobbling together different types of okay. uh, And if transportation has any funding for that study as well, it's always a good route to go. Okay. Transportation. Thank you all very much. Uh, that concludes our CIP discussion today. I think we may have done most of our proposals, uh, but if you do have any additional um, recommendations, please make sure you're really clear about that with staff before our meeting uh, on October 4th, where we expect to have a final approval of our CIP recommendations. Uh, we're going to take a short break um, before we come back to our next agenda item. Um, let's do 10 minutes max. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here, Dan. <laughs> thank and you. we have Nick Norris. He's here too. I'll come up. Great, Nick. <laughs> okay. Tell us about this. All right, so this is a proposed alley closure at 723 West Pacific Avenue, uh, approximately. Um, the alley vacation is requested by all of the adjacent landowners. Um, it's located in sort of an isolated area of uh, the downtown. Um, you've got I-15 right on the west. You have the rail corridor right to the east of it. And then you have the 400 south viaduct to the north and the I-15 500 south ramp to the south. So you're kind of blocked in on all sides. Um, and this area is zoned CG, um, general commercial, which allows up to light industrial uses, and the surrounding properties are generally light industrial related uses. And the alley itself was originally uh, accommodated residential uses before I-15 was built, but since that time it's been used for industrial uses. Um, and the entirety of the proposed alley closure is highlighted in yellow. So these are uh, photos of the entrance points to the alley. On the north side um, is the top photo, and you can see um, the alley right along the building. Um, and then on the lower uh, picture, you can see the east entrance to the alley, um, and that's sometimes used to get to the parking lot. 
So in considering closing an alley, the alley closure must satisfy at least one city policy consideration, and these include lack of use as a public alley, whether public safety issues, whether it serves as a positive urban design element, and whether it is to be closed for a community purpose. And in this case, um, the alley qualifies for lack of use as a public alley. The alley has been used for private vehicle parking and as a private driveway for decades. Um, it's paved and marked as part of the parking lot. Uh, it also doesn't serve as a positive urban design element. Um, in some areas of the city, like downtown, the alleys can serve as shortcuts, pedestrian cut-throughs, or service, service uh, lanes. Um, in this case, it doesn't support any of that. Um, and again, this is supported by all of the adjacent property owners. And the Planning Commission recommended approval of the full closure. And if closed, the alley would be split down the middle and s sold to the adjacent property owners for fair market value. And uh, with that, I can take any questions, and the applicants are also here to answer any questions as well. Great. Council members, any questions in regards to the, the alley closure? I have one, and that is, why did they, why are they not pursuing the, is it the north-south alley vacation? They're now pursuing the entirety of the alley. Oh, they are? Yes, they are. Yep. Okay, I read that wrong. I thought that they were going to abandon the north-south and just go with the east-west. Um, that was a consideration, but they're, they're going for the full the thing. Yep. thing. And it's a single property owner for all of those parcels, um, parking each, lot? Oh, each one is a separate property owner. So is there any concern about uh, providing access to 745 versus, uh, I mean, along that uh, right away that the alley provides along 723. Yeah, and the property owners have come to an agreement about that, um, and they can fill you in um, if you have questions about how that's going to be handled. Um, ultimately, I, I believe that 723 um, will sell some of their alley or have an easement for the 745 West property, um, but they can provide you any details on that. That's great. Why don't we have the petitioner come up and tell us what's going to happen with the 745 access? And my only concern is that that we, we, I mean, clearly there's a property access along that line that the alley provided, so that that we're just making sure that we accommodate that long term. Uh, I'm uh, Scott Thornton, the manager of Thornton Investments, which is the owner of the 745 property. And, uh, and that's where Thornton Plastics is Thornton Plastics, right? yes. Correct. And then to my... Why don't you... Let's mm. address the alley you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Jeff Beck, I own 723 West Pacific Avenue. And um, th this was supposed to go before you guys in July, and there was... We kind of took it off the table to discuss an access easement for Thornton's from, you know, we're going to vacate the alley and then give them so many feet of access so that they can, they have parking underneath their building um, that they need to access. Then also the south uh, triangle of their property as well needs to be accessed. So. Yeah, so we've come to an agreement that he would grant uh, the westerly 15 feet of that 723 property, which would be sufficient for us to get vehicles into our underground parking and also any heavy vehicles that might be needed for the south end of the building. And you're so. splitting the the alley down the middle it would do, uh, yeah, plus an additional split. easement for right. access so that really gives us about 25 I mean if you take where the alley is right now which is about 10 feet wide plus the 15 foot easement that gives us a full 25 feet from the edge of the building for us to to have access and so because of that agreement which is uh, which is you know, will be documented real you know, legal, under, you will know, have legal documentation real soon. And so I think we're, we're good with that. And I just have a follow-up question for staff on that. When we have a property owners with a, a agreement to do a legal easement, how does that line up with our process for vacation and, and disposal of the property? Do we, we, do we record at the same time? Do we put requirements that the easement be recorded first or? Uh, not sure. So, so we would require that easement to be put in place at the same time that, or prior to the alley recording. So they and usually that, would happen at, in conjunction with the same document. And that's generally a part of the ordinance that we adopt when we, if we adopt the ordinance. Yeah, right. just to make sure okay. that, that we're not doing something that deprives somebody of their okay. access. Thanks. So that would be required to be either at the same time or prior to? 
I think you have to at the same time because you don't own it and you can't give an easement on it until we, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> until we give it out. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we couldn't, I mean. You might be able to the, on the property, yeah. yeah, but the the half of the alley wouldn't be able to. Uh, attorneys work all this right. stuff okay. out. So. So, so, no, I'm not an attorney. My brother's an attorney. Right. So, so, so just to be clear, so, so you would actually like have in place the easement on the on the half of the alley that would be done simultaneously. That's my as sense as, from as what as you're well describing, as, as well as the additional 15 feet. 15 yeah. Feet. Okay. Any questions for the petitioner? Great. Thank you very much. We took our break early. So uh, do we have, is Fred Philpot here? He is not here yet. Um, we can take a break. I don't think he's expected until 435. So we can, uh, we can take that break until Phil gets here. I mean Fred, sorry. So we'll, we'll come back as soon as Fred's here or at 435, whichever is first. packet that we have today in regards to it. So Jennifer, I think, will be uh, joining us shortly, but why don't you just dive on into it and give us a, a background and where we're at and why we're here and where it looks like we're going. All righty. Just help us start, out. Mr. Chair, yes. is this a one-shot deal or what's our plan uh, going no, this forward? Is, this is uh, the the consultant's report that was given to the administration that was then forwarded to us without any recommendations from the administration, uh, but I just thought it was key for us to, Stan and I thought it was key for us to have it on the agenda to discuss it and, and move it forward. And our next step as a council would be what? We would be looking for a recommendation from the administration. And we would have another meeting at that point. So, so it's more like a briefing. Correct. And questions. Why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, if I might just remind, <laughs> remind us that we need to adopt a new ordinance and then it's 90 days from the adoption of that ordinance to implementation of any new impact fees. And I believe there's some public uh, input tonight and Thursday. Well, Cindy's got some Sorry, points this morning. Too. Uh, they had some public input this morning, and I think they have some on Thursday, um, and then they will be sending us a, a formal document. So the consultant is available to both branches to consult, and so that's why he's uh, here tonight. And uh, he did a briefing just with staff yesterday, and it was very, very helpful. Thank you. So I hope you'll find the same. So I also want to just clarify on the comment. Uh, with regards to the 90-day wait period, uh, that's for any increase in the impact fees. So it, if we're proposing a decrease, that would be effective immediately. But wouldn't, um, if you're putting the fee into a new area, which is proposed under this study, wouldn't that be? An increase. Fall? That's an increase. Yeah, so if we don't have an impact fee currently in place, then any impact fee would be an increase. So if, even if it's a decrease of our current fee if we're expanding the collection area then it's uh, considered an increase so correct? um the, the the main area that would affect it would seem to me would be roads in the the sort of uh traditional part the main part of the original part of the city is that yes. correct okay. uh i don't know if am i okay just yep. to jump right in yep. okay <laughs> uh so yeah i'll um We've touched upon impact fees uh, in the past. I'll uh, highlight some of those variables again with regards to our methodology and approach, then get into the details of each of the components that we've evaluated and, and then provide an illustration of the proposed uh, impact fees as well as some comparables for other communities. As we've discussed in the past, there are two requirements that, that we have to fulfill. That's the completion of an impact fee facilities plan and the adoption of an impact fee analysis and impact fee ordinance. The document that has been made available uh, fulfills the requirements as it, as it relates to the impact fee facilities plan and impact fee analysis. 
uh, then the adoption of the ordinance is what will be the final uh, execution of that impact fee uh, schedule. Uh, we've highlighted this and discussed this in a little bit more detail in previous, me in previous meetings, but uh, the primary objectives of this approach is we, we need to look at demand within a specific service area, evaluate levels of service, uh, look at the existing facilities inventory, evaluate what future capital facilities are needed, and then complete a financing strategy and, and evaluate how facilities were funded in the past and how they're intended to be funded moving forward. Timeline-wise, uh, we are uh, still at some of these beginning stages, so it, it looks like there's a, a lot left to, to go, but um, this can also happen pretty rapidly as it relates to the adoption of the impact fee. We have uh, presented findings to staff um, and to administration. We've also had some discussions with stakeholders, so we did meet, w uh, have a, an open house this morning uh, with regards to the impact fee facilities plan and impact fee analysis. We have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow for, with the Downtown Alliance, and then we also have an open house scheduled for a Thursday evening to review the preliminary findings. What we've also indicated is that this is a preliminary report and we're soliciting feedback to enlighten uh, our findings and provide feedback to uh, help inform uh, this document uh, because it is subject to change and, and can be revised as we move forward. So it's, it's definitely not the final, uh, doesn't represent the final product yet. So I don't mean to jump in, but I'm going to, Fred. I we, would appreciate you, that. Did you just show the same presentation today at your meeting, the stakeholder meeting? Yes. And were there were question and answer as well? Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, there were four uh, people in attendance representing uh, the development community outside of uh, staff members that were in attendance. And it was very much question and answer. Um, we, we went through each component that I'll review this evening and, and allowed them to... Uh, shoot any questions off to me so mm -hmm. and, and please interrupt uh, I, I want it to be an open dialogue so if you have questions just interject um, so uh, we'll get into the details with regards to each of these uh, components with regards to the park impact fee we look at establishing a level of service on a per capita basis and look at the uh, investment that's been made within the park and public lands arena. Uh, we've isolated 1,275 city-owned and funded acres for an estimated land value of 191 million 292. Uh, that's based on a land value of 150,000, so it's uh, quite a bit lower than uh, some parcels across the city. We also look at the improvement value for the improvements with on that land, uh, city-owned land, and that totaled $107 million. We then look at that uh, based on the population. As you can see here, the land value per capita plus the improvement value per capita gets us a total value of $1,553 per capita uh, for purposes of determining a level of service. Uh, so that's really the basis of our level of service. It's a value per capita based on existing facilities. It's also important to note that we've excluded some facilities that were funded using a GO bond. There's a property tax levy associated with that, and so to, to ensure that new development is, isn't paying twice, in essence through a property tax levy as well as through an impact fee, we've uh, eliminated those facilities from the, the calculation of the impact fee. Uh, when we look at the capital facilities as we move forward, uh, it's important to distinguish the different types of methodologies that we use when calculating an impact fee. So uh, we can put those into two camps, a growth-driven methodology and a, a plan-based methodology. A growth-driven methodology is really uh, based on incremental growth within the community and you match your facilities to, to handle that growth. So a, a park impact fee is typically growth-driven, meaning um, in a lot of cases, we don't have to have a park in advance of uh, population. We can build it as population comes into the community, whereas uh, transportation or water-related infrastructure, for example, we typically have to build that infrastructure in advance of that population coming on 
in order to be able to provide the essential service, services uh, related to that infrastructure. Uh, but we do evaluate what, what the plan is or, or if there are capital facility plans as it relates to park infrastructure. Uh, based on um, the impact fee and that growth driven approach and the projected population, uh, we would anticipate the need to invest approximately 44 million in uh, park land acquisition or park improvements. That's an, an, an annual average spending of 4.4. Historically, uh, in the CIP, we've spent approximately 2.6 million excluding debt. Uh, so based on that population growth, there's a need to uh, potentially escalate that expenditure. But again, that's growth driven. So if we don't have the growth, then we wouldn't have the capital infrastructure either. So it's and, and correlated. In addition, if we had uh, higher growth, that is con uh, considered in the calculation as well, right? Yes, that would be proportionate. So we would see the need to invest more as uh, we have increased population, because that would correspond to increased impact fee collections as well. We'd see more development within the community. And so can you help me, uh, when we're looking at e impact fee structures and state guidelines, what, is there a specific indicator that uh, population growth is tied to? I mean, are we, are we constrained to a 10-year census? reporting or is there some other mechanism that we could use as well? There's nothing in the state statute that indicates a requirement uh, except that case law suggests we have to be reasonable and proportionate. So we just have to show that the data sets that we're using are reasonable and proportionate and that we have, haven't skewed the data somehow. Because uh, the reality is our, our projections are likely wrong. Um, it, it's challenging to predict the future, and so we put our best guess with regards to what that will look like. And it's uh, the city's responsibility to evaluate that from year to year. And if those assumptions change dramatically, then that may necessitate an update to the impact fee facilities plan. And if I might, Jennifer, um, I know that we are looking at interim, uh, several different types of interim estimates of our population growth between mm -hmm. census, but uh, do we have, does the city hire or contract out those estimates or is there some index that we're tied to that's uh, pretty reliable? Um, I mean, I can't speak to the population estimates specifically that um, that this firm used, although they mentioned all of the typical sources that like we use with the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. Um, we do have a contract with the um, demographer at the University of Utah, but I actually think she often relies on the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. That I don't know if there are other sources that... Yeah, so when we look at this, the Governor's Office is a is a variable that we evaluate and then looking at historic data with regards to 2000 census to 2010 census data. That, uh, the governor's office data's data is extrapolated into what is called traffic area zones. And so um, regional planning organizations like Wasatch Front Regional Council uh, aggregates that data and then provides that to transportation planners, which was in this case provided to Farron Piers for traffic analysis and so we pegged population growth to those variables uh, so down the pipeline it's come from governor's office of planning and budget and then uh, to the to those traffic area zones to get it trip counts and then we uh, utilize those trip counts to extrapolate uh, growth in commercial property residential property and overall population and I'm just wondering if this is something we want we want to consider going forward in, in consideration of sort of the pretty significant growth we're experiencing right now and certainly for the next couple of years as units come online, the, uh, uh, some process within the city to be consistent about estimating our growth, even if they do, if, if we do access those other indicators, I think I'm not sure that there's anyone uh, charged with watching that right. at the city um, to make those modifications. So I'm wondering if that's part of our conversation of implementing this plan going forward is that a very strategic uh, request or, f or even funding to look at monitoring that annually as part and, of our uh, and impact we do, fee. Um, 
We do do an annual updating of the population in conjunction with the budget. So it's a, actually it's a section in the budget book that's updated. But to my understanding, it never kind of follows through and updates the impact fee plan because the impact fee plan is such a rigorous <laughs> process that um, it seems like we only update it every maybe five years, six years. So um, I don't know if there's a way to build in a more kind of regular updating of the population estimates or if that's just part of... Yeah, so impact fees, that is one of the challenges as it relates to impact fees. Is it's um, Again, it's a snapshot today of what we think the future is going to look like, and those assumptions are likely to change tomorrow and, and over the course of the next several years. And we encourage communities to look at those variables, and uh, if there's a reasonable fluctuation, that's understood. You know, we're we're going to see, especially where you where we utilize straight line or linear growth estimates. The reality is those are there's peaks and troughs in in growth. Uh, so what we we are looking for and what we encourage um, municipalities and our clients to look for is large deviations in those proposed plans. And if that occurs, then that may trigger an update to the plan uh, outside of maybe that traditional cycle of every three to five years. So, uh, for example, a recession could hit, and we could see all growth stop, and uh, and therefore the, the need for projects or system improvements will, it would also tank. That may be a, a time to, to revise the impact fee facilities plan and evaluate that. There are also a few other things that have come up recently in council discussions that um, in staff uh, staff's discussion with the consultant we, we um, identified as, oh, here's a key area where you would need to change your plan if some of these ideas were pursued. So one of the ideas was if the council pursued um, a significant funding uh, paradigm shift in the way you fund infrastructure, which is what you have a priority about this year, um, you would need to update the impact fees facility plan. Because the impact fees facilities plan is based on what you've been doing which I think the full council has agreed is not adequate, and that's acknowledged, but all, all, all the plan can do is, is base the plan on um, actual data rather than what we hope uh, for the future. And um, so I think that just that's maybe a red flag for um, you guys as the council to know that you know, if you pursue uh, like a, any, any other sort of independent funding stream for roads, independent of sort of the way you've previously funded roads, that would necessitate, likely necessitate an update to the impact fee plan. Um, and same goes for other uh, assets, I think, as well. Erin? Thanks. Uh, if we're starting to collect a, a tally list of possible policy considerations, um, I'd like to tack this one on there that should we all be dead and gone and all of the institutional knowledge be gone, that there be some uh, piece of policy perhaps that triggers a reevaluation um, that if, if it's possible to, to list all of these triggers, mm -hmm. realizing we can't probably predict all of them, that I'd love this to be added to our list of considerations. Yeah, Unless uh, you can come up with a better way for us to instill that trigger. I think at the, the high level, it, you know, it is difficult to determine every trigger. But if we go back to the basic assumptions of this process, which is looking at demand, looking at your level of service, looking at existing facilities and future facilities and your finance strategy, those five elements, if you see a substantial change in any of those five elements, that would necessitate it an update to your impact fee. So if your demand variable changes substantially, that has a trigger or a, a, an effect on all of those other components that we evaluate. And so I think, you know, if, if I were to look at it, those five variables, you know, any substantial deviation in the assumptions for those five variables would be uh, uh, potentially a need to update the, the plan. And, and Cindy had a follow-up too. One of the things that we asked the consultant yesterday is if, if you um, have to wait to do another impact fee update um, a, a, until after you have demonstrated your intent to increase funding for infrastructure. And I, it would be, I think, helpful if he were to answer that for, you, for the city council. What we were 
trying to describe as a scenario where um, because you have made this your priority, if, if the council were to say as part of our CIP adoption this year, we are taking XYZ steps to increase the level of funding or we are doing such and such initiative. Uh, the question was, could, could the council then uh, use that as part of, um, of this process rather than coming back later to amend it? So can we ask the consultant to address that? Yes, yeah, so uh, there is no requirement um, or stipulation within the statute that says there has to be a history of spending. Uh, for example, it's, it's more a risk uh, factor. Uh, and, and when I say risk, it's the risk of challenge. You know, so uh, the, the Impact Fee Act does require that we identify the financing strategy and, and determine if impact fees are a uh, a necessary component in that finance strategy. And so uh, part of that process is, is outlining how that would occur and, and to uh, establish that so that we could show within the impact fee the justification for um, potentially an increase in expenditures and, the, and therefore a proportional increase in the impact fee allocation. Uh, but that, that isn't required. There be a history there. Um, the, the process that we've gone through is trying to evaluate Again, what has happened in the past um, and uh, establish an impact fee that reflects the realities of the, the expenditures that have, have, have occurred historically. Um, however, uh, the, the fire impact fee will illustrate that um, you know, through the utilization of an MBA, uh, a building authority, uh, we're able to secure funding to, to exceed the historic expenditures and provide for the facilities that are necessary moving forward. So that is an illustration of we've secured funding and we're going to pull that in with associated interest to ensure that that happens. Um, other communities as it relates to transportation face the very issue that Salt Lake City is facing which is there's a substantial need and how do we fund that and are looking to alternative funding mechanisms to make sure that that can happen. So. Uh, the risk is if, if you pull it in now um, and basically make the assumptions of increased expenditures and then that doesn't happen, then you're uh, required to reimburse. Um, or the alternative is to wait for those to become a uh, reality or to at least the, the policies in place to ensure that that's uh, a reality. Uh, then the impact fee could be adjusted as we uh, have the, a better handle on what that expenditure might look like. Um, <clears throat> it occurs to me that, and this is just from my limited history with impact fees and, and how our, this body's been looking at them, is there, is there some sort of standard timeline that you could suggest that would make sense for a review um, in, a, in addition to or, um, well, in addition to your triggers? So it, it, is there a three-year, a five-year, a, a horizon where you say if, if, if you didn't hit your, one of those triggers didn't happen or is there some sort of standardized uh, review timeline that would just make sense? Yes, we, we typically recommend a, an evaluation every three to five years depending on the size of the community and the growth. Um, you know, you have some communities that are much closer to build out and don't see a lot of as much new development and so they can allow for that more like the five-year window um, but where you see communities that have growth we recommend closer to three year for uh, an update to the impact fee facilities plan and impact fee analysis but we also recommend at least an annual review whether that corresponds with CIP or budgeting to say are we comfortable with this is there a deviation from these assumptions Look at those triggers. Yeah, yeah, based on those triggers. So at least internally, there's a mechanism to look at that, an in-depth analysis every year, um, because you know again we can't control the timing of those assumptions or when they're going to change, and so an annual review is is recommended at least internally. And uh, Cindy and Jennifer, I know this has come up around other issues, but do we have a mechanism for tying? the annual budget process to some sort of feedback or review of this. I mean, is there, is there a way we can 
um, trigger that going forward that, so that we don't end up in a situation like we've had previously where we're 10 years between plans. Oh, let me take a stab at it. Mm -hmm. the, um, absolutely, we intend to bring it in. The problem is that as a city, we don't have the resources to really um, maximize the opportunities by following the impact fee, the RDA, the CIP, the state road funds, and grant opportunities. We don't have anyone tasked with that, and I think that we don't have anyone funded to do that. So ideally, that would be a long-term solution. Uh, we can you know, patch it together as we go, but so far we have not succeeded. Thank you. I do think that just talking about it, and I think having everyone um, much more educated about impact fees now than they were last year and the year before, I think every time um, it's discussed, um, people understand it a little bit more, and um, we certainly as staff understand more about it every time, and I think just this year's CIP discussion was very different than in recent years where impact fees were sort of um, looked at in parallel with um, the general funds funding of different projects and just that approach um, is different than in years past so maybe baby steps are, <laughs> are a good thing. So when we get to uh, the specifics can, as it relate to the Can I jump in for a minute? Sorry, I just, yeah. um, this is a way bigger sort of overarching question and, and I don't know who is best necessarily to answer it but as we look at impacts which would you say have the greatest impact? Residential or commercial uses? I think you, I, I just am interested to know how yeah, you see and, that. Yeah, and uh, the answer to that is it, it depends on what service we're, we're looking at. Uh, so for park impact fees, by statute, we can only assess that to residential, residential. development with the assumption that residential development is the only uh, development type that is utilizing those park facilities. So even though people may on their lunch break from an office building want to go hang out at the park, um, by state statute we can't yes, correct. do that? Okay. Yeah, so that has been discussed where, you know, I, I work in downtown Salt Lake City and I frequent park facilities on occasion when my, when my kids come to visit me during the lunch break. So I, there definitely is, you know, as, as you'll notice with, uh, with all of these, there's... Um, there's arguments on both sides of the coin. Uh, by statute, though, we, we have to assess the impact fee for residential development as it relates to parks. When we get to the other components, I'll show you the variables. Okay. Uh, will, you, that, will you do that as we go through? Yes. Thank yeah, you so, so much. It, it highlights, based on the evaluation we've made, what are the impacts by land use type uh, on average. So we are averaging that up to major land use categories within the city, and that's how the impact fee is assessed uh, within, within the community. So when we look at, the, again, the park impact fee level of service, when we put that valuation on a per capita basis, adding the land value and then the value f uh, of improvements, we also add in the impact fee fund balance, again, because that is a valuation that can be expended on park improvements, so that's an, an added level of service uh, that can be expended, so we pull that in as positive. That brings up the total value per capita to 1596 and then we allocate that based on household size uh, within uh, single family and multifamily to get a fee per household of 5043 for single family and 3000 for multifamily. And if I could just pause here to, sorry, sorry back to this, um, because I think to highlight a few things for council members just so you're aware of how this um, plan differs from the previous approach. Um, there's two things that this, this slide illustrates. One is the um, growth, and I'm probably calling it the wrong thing, but the growth approach yes. yep. to calculating the impact fee where you decide your, or you calculate your total value of your level of service for parks, which in this case is um, per capita is 1596 per capita. And then instead of having um, some project total of all the projects and then you're dividing it by the growth, you instead multiply the value by each person you have in the household. So each person you have per unit is how they're getting the different fees for single versus multifamily. So it's that 1596 multiplied by the 3.16 people per single family home and 1.88 people per multifamily unit 
um, that is causing the fees to be different for multi and single family. And that's different from the previous approach, which had a single fee uh, for either single family or multifamily. And the reason that that was uh, done that way is that there was a total amount of the projects you wanted, because as you mentioned before, there was a, a long list of all the projects that could be um, built uh, for parks impact fees, and there was a total at the bottom of the list, you know, total for the 10 years of projects. And then that was divided by how many units um, we thought that would, would you know, occur over that planning period. So it's just a different approach on two fronts. Um, one is separating out the multifamily versus single family. And then the other approach is separating out uh, or changing the methodology to calculate it in the sense calculating up rather than kind of dividing by the growth. Um, I think in the end, this, this approach would seem to be a lot more flexible in terms of actually getting the money out and spent on projects because rather than having um, you know this tennis court at this park you instead have a list of park amenities and you know that that a certain percentage of it is growth related and so anytime those amenities are suggested it would be impact fee eligible regardless of you know which park it is if we forgot to list it it wouldn't you know which happened a couple of times in the last plan it's like oh we didn't think about this project when we adopted it and it's not that, eligible it seems like it happened more than a couple of times yes, it yes. happened quite a bit actually um, so, so I have two, two questions. One related to the um, pretty significant difference between a single family and a multifamily. And I wonder if any, um, I, I'm just intuitively, and I might be wrong, it seems that a multifamily um, residence may have a higher requirement for park space than a single family residence because I'm assuming in most single family there's some yard space or some you know, side yard, backyard, something like that, where in multifamily that is unlikely to exist at all. And so is that something that's a consideration as we're looking at that? I mean, I, I, I understand your model you're using and it doesn't really factor into that yeah. demand of a single family versus a multifamily. But have you, have you seen that other places? Is that a consideration? Yes, uh, the, the comment is frequently brought up with regards to single family versus multifamily. The, the challenge is proving that. Uh, parks are, are free use. There isn't a toll, you know, a toll gate for each park unless it's a, you know, regional complex, for example. Um, but arguably, you look at some facilities, and they're at, they're more likely that they could be utilized more heavily by single family, especially if it's a soccer field or a baseball field or some sort of a pool, for example. Or you know, some facilities that would actually be the opposite that that uh, larger household sizes would would use those more frequently. And I can only speak from my experience as a single family dweller with uh, four kids. We we utilize park space regularly um, even though we have a small backyard and similarly uh, your multifamily typically well I shouldn't say typically but may have for example project improvements similar to a backyard where there's either a, a playground space or, or some sort of recreation space <coughs> on site uh, that serves that specific project and then the system improvements or the general parks are designed to serve everybody so the challenge is, 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 is really finding the data that proves one way or the other. Uh, it, it feels like uh, the part of the assumption is kids versus no kids, and I can totally see that in the numbers. Um, but part of the desire that we are, I think, expressing as a community and what we're hearing from development is that there may be an increasing demand for bedroom units that might accommodate young kids in multifamily. But we would need to demonstrate that that is a trend we're seeing rather than this historic data that, that this is based on. Yes, and it's important to note um, some communities have uh, to address that issue um, pegged the single family to the reduced amount. So said, well, rather than charging single family the 5043 we're going to assess both the $3,000. There is risk associated with that in that there's, there could be a level of service decrease, especially if you have a substantial amount of single family dwellings that will occur. But that's actually a pretty unlikely in yes. Salt Lake City. So looking at Salt Lake City, the risk under that approach is 
is reduced just based on the nature of the, the new dwelling units that are likely right. to be constructed moving forward. It's, it's likely, and our analysis is projected that uh, it's more multifamily dwelling that right. will be moving forward. Certainly so, the recent trend. Yes. So uh, another question, not uh, related to that, but rather related to eligible fees. We had a discussion earlier in our CIP. If we are looking at parks projects on existing parks land that increase the ability to handle more people on that footprint, then that is my understanding is that's probably eligible now. Yes. So that's that's the flexibility of this approach is that we're saying the level of investment is is provided as a dollar amount, and it's up to the city to reinvest to that level moving forward, whether that's expansion of existing parks, the acquisition of land, or a combination of the bo of both of those. Um, the the land value um, may be prohibited prohibitive within Salt Lake City to continue to acquire parcels of land. So it's a matter of expanding existing infrastructure. Uh, within the community and so um, we have to again evaluate each the city will have to evaluate each uh, proposal uh, and ensure that there's expansion uh, infrastructure that's being contemplated so it has to be for growth related infrastructure and, and one final question as it relates to parks a conversation that we've been having more frequently is the idea of linear parks along streets that connect either existing park services or, or new park services is there a mechanism or, or do you see a, a challenge or an opportunity with defining a portion of a street improvement as a pedestrian park component? And, and I like your sense on that because in some areas we're very specifically saying, well, we, don't ha we can't acquire new park space, but we have these incredibly massive right-of-ways. Yeah. And what, what happens if we convert part of that to a linear parkway, uh, you know, a, a, a sense of some sort of, I'll say this tongue-in-cheek, mm -hmm. Parisian sort of, uh, not really a park, but the feel of a park kind of thing that would be, a, a, that could have, facilities that are park like and could even have some activity space it, what's your sense of that we we would just need to be careful that we're not double charging so if if uh, it falls within the realm of quasi transportation or park that it's not included in both that we don't try to to count that twice as a transportation improvement as well as a park improvement uh, as long as we delineate that uh, and say okay we're we're looking at park improvements then if that's expansionary and we're adding uh, land, sod and irrigation, benches, you know, whatever those park amenities are, then yeah, that's expansion to our system and, and we're, um, we're building in that flexibility because the, the desires of the community with regards to park and recreation improvements will change and are, and are very fluid. Yeah. And this allows for that uh, fluid approach. So the specific examples I'm thinking of are the median improvements that we're looking at putting in some of our very wide right-of-ways that actually do get used as mm -hmm. open space. We've never really defined them as open space or park space, but it feels like that certainly is a use that, that happens there. And, and could we consider that a park space? And the other part of it is uh, something like Central 9, where we're looking at um, significantly increasing the pedestrian right-of-way with plantings and trees and maybe even garden space and benches and a portion of that certainly is pedestrian improvements but it also feels like a portion of that could be park space amenities um, but I just don't I want to make sure we're not how would we be careful about identifying that I don't want to I don't want to put us at risk uh, with our impact fees uh, I think that would require dialogue between the Parks Department and uh, legislative body to determine if this is fulfilling that park need. Uh, we'd have to bring it back to this level of service and investment and, and ensure that what we're investing is meeting the needs of our residents as it relates to park space, open space, and public lands. And, and if it's meeting that objective, then, then I think we, we would be good in making that investment because there's no definition with regards to size, shape, or amenities as it relates to parks. It's, we have to continue to maintain an, an investment 
and that's what we're requiring new development to do is to maintain this investment per capita and now the city has to execute that investment as it relates to parks and public lands. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, one more question. As we have a look at the, uh, the house, persons per household, and we know that we have probably more households with dogs than with kids at this point, we sort of hit that, that tipping point. That doesn't come into effect at all in this analysis, does it? No, we don't look at a non-human population, if that's what you're meaning. That's what I'm wondering about, because um, we're increasingly we're hitting park amenities for a dog specific um, amenities, which don't factor into household size or anything else, but have hit a tipping point with more households having those than otherwise. And I'm wondering how that is discussed in, or not at all. In my mind, it, just, it, it really is the flexibility of this approach, which as the needs of your community change, then the way that we invest that $1,596 per capita may shift towards different mm -hmm. types of improvements, uh, whether that be dog parks or related infrastructure, rather than new, new tennis courts. How does household size so factor into that again? So, so the, the that, bigger the household size, how does that factor in? That produces a larger impact fee. That's so my question, is that as, as we see households with kids decrease, so the number of average household size decreases on this, but maybe dogs increase? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, the, the challenge is, is having the data to support it. So yeah. if there, you know, the, definitely there can be initiatives to try to get it more detailed data with regards to utilization mm -hmm. uh, and frequency within park space. And whatever the, that, those initiatives produce can inform these decisions. Absent of that information, most communities look towards the status quo, which is the household size and an impact fee per capita. So it's a data issue on our end about collecting yes, it yeah, and then yeah, presenting Evaluating it. those variables and seeing if we can get something that's concrete. Okay. Uh, Aaron, we'll go with Derek. You see, what we need you to do is actually qualify dogs as children. <laughs> <laughs> well, most people who own dogs would, would so make that qualifying. That's what we need you to do <laughs> formally here. Although my last um, dog was. So I just wanted to make sure, going back to, to Councilmember Penfold's question about that balance between transportation and park, that if we had linear park space that had trail components, connectivity components built into it, do we, I mean, is the risk, the the uh, legal challenge risk there. Is there a tipping point where we find that, you know, the, uh, we want to define it as a park and yet there's a trail and the tra trail is generating a lot of trips. Um, yeah. Is there is that how we contemplate what that legal balance is the prior to funding? And can I add to that, Aaron? Do we have the ability to combine those funding streams. So if we identify this is a trail and a pedestrian improvement, so it's a transportation impact fee, can we still do a parks impact fee for some of the amenities along that corridor or some? Yeah, definitely. There's communities that have, have done that and uh, isolated what component of a proposed improvement is related to transportation versus what is related to parks and recreation, or if you look at utilities, what portion of a, you know, tearing out the roadway is transportation related if we expand that roadway, for example, versus what is related to the water impact fee as it relates to replacing the pipe under that, that roadway. So definitely that's uh, possible to look at these improvements and say what, what, are, what, are we, what demand are we uh, servicing here? What are we trying to satisfy? and that may cross boundaries. We, what we cannot do is use park impact fees to pay for transportation and for transportation impact fees to pay for park facilities. So once that delineation is made, you can't cross boundaries with regards to that. But many communities have established linear parks and uh, again, the shape is irrelevant. It's, it's what it's used for and the amenities on that, uh, on that facility. Um, I, for me, the, the risk is more looking at your service area and ensuring that you're uniform as you apply those impact fees across the citywide service area. So ensuring that you're not um, 
putting all your eggs in one basket unless all of your development eggs are in that basket as well. So, for example, if, example, if all development is occurring within one area, then it's likely that there'll be uh, quite a bit more investment potentially within that area to meet the growing demands of that, that area. But if, you know, as, as we're calculating, this is a single citywide service area, and so the, there's flexibility in that to evaluate where the growth is occurring and apply the infrastructure to those growth areas and ensure that we're maintaining connectivity and the level of service across the city. And I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but I'm not clear just yet. When you talk about that we can't uh, cross those boundaries, you're speaking financially, right? Correct. So that we could have a project that takes place in a right of way and transportation is going to fund this piece of the project and parks could fund this piece of the project. Yes. Okay. So if, well, let's you. say if that were 50-50, we can then take all transportation impact fees and fund 100% of that. And, and I think what all of this is pointing out, I think um, this this future plan will be really wonderful in terms of how flexible it will be. And, and I think this exact problem that we run into so many times, which is that even over five years, the community's um, ideas of what they mean by a park amenity has changed, you know. And, but I think what it will also require is a lot more, a significant amount more planning and foresight and coordination among city departments to um, utilize those fees. Uh, because I think the opportunities are there to do that. Um, but it's just, it's that whole idea of making sure that we've defined the project adequately so that we can justify both the use of transportation impact fees and the use of parks impact fees. And that we haven't left anything on the table because the whole point is to reinvest these dollars that we're collecting. So. Alrighty. Um, I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, so looking at these um, increases, um, in fees, I wonder, so we had a, we're doing a downtown and a sugar house transportation study and we hired consultants to do that. And one of the really interesting data points that they brought to us is that for every parking stall that we require a residential developer to build, it increases the residential rent by approximately $225 a month. My question is, have you done any analysis on the increases in these impact fees on affordability in the city at all? We haven't. Can you do that? Uh, we probably can do that. That yeah, would be really it, interesting it, for me to find out. Uh, the question is defining what is affordable. Uh, if you're looking at affordable housing, for example, um, there is uh, the ability to actually uh, potentially waive impact fees as it relates to affordable housing, which I think the city which has that policy. We have that right now. Y yeah, I see yeah. that. Uh, so I guess it's not so much about the affordability. I'm wondering just what the increase will do to general rents, affordable or not, if that's information you can put together. Yeah, we can so look into that. So market rate, how much would it increase rents? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can I just clarify? Yeah. Did you say you calculated it was 200 and something a month? Indeed, yeah. In Into the future? Well, that, I, can we get them to check that for us? Because I'm, I'm hopeful that's not it, but I don't know. You know, I, looking at these numbers as it relates to just the park impact fees, um, again, it, where we're looking at... It's a one-time... It's a one-time fee. Fee. Uh, where we're seeing, you know, for example, multifamily going from 2,875 to 3,000 or a 4% increase. Right. I would be surprised if that would produce um, as substantial of an impact on, and, especially and where most, well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of developers uh, build within multiple communities and experience uh, impact fees of this nature in other communities across the state. And, uh, and really Derek and areas. I, and I'll have to fact check this number too, but and it, I think it depends on the project, but based on like underground parking or something like that, uh, uh, one space can range anywhere from about 12,000 to 24,000 uh, per stall. And so the, it could easily have that kind of impact over the long-term financing of a project. 
Yes, I, I'm just making the comparison that yeah, an increase will yeah. make a difference in what a developer will pass on to the tenant, for instance. We've right? had uh, developers argue the opposite in public hearings where this is a cost that they cannot pass on because markets establish the price points for housing. And any increase in the impact fee is a cost that they can't uh, pass on. Um, which is, I guess, the birth of the 90-day wait period, where uh, any impact fee increase requires a 90-day wait period. Um, but also, we, we have heard that, uh, and, and this is anecdotal as well, so you know, if, if we do need to provide numbers to this, um, we can look into that. But impact fees are a one-time fee that, uh, from an economic standpoint, are a de direct cost uh, to the buyer. So any increase here results, you know, if we're increasing by 4%, then the cost of that unit is going to go up by that amount. So here we're looking at the $125 increase. The value of that, uh, the cost of that unit is now going to go up by $125. Sure. Um, quick question. If I read this correctly, uh, on the affordable housing front, we're not permitted by state statute to add a non-standard impact fee for, say, affordable housing. I know Denver, for instance, they have what they call a linkage fee for developments, and I imagine the Colorado statute is much different than Utah, but c can we create an additional impact fee if we desired to for affordable housing or some sort of j fund for housing? No, not a, not under the, if I understand your question correctly, we cannot assess an impact fee other than by the process that's established here, which is going through a demand analysis and showing those variables. However, if, if we isolate affordable housing example as a classification or a class within our fee structure, then that can be isolated and we can look at the demand characteristics uh, that are generated from that specific class within our fee structure. But to arbitrarily say we're going to make an assessment or, or, or establish an assessment on a certain type of housing without providing the analysis, that is not allowed under statute. Um, okay. There are other mechanisms that generate funds for affordable housing, whether that's through the RDA uh, and utilizing those types of funds, but the impact fees are not a mechanism to establish um, alternative fees. Uh, we have to develop it under this structure and would have to look at that as a, as a specific class of development type. Okay, so you're saying it is possible if we go through the process of establishing housing, affordable housing as, uh, Jennifer? I think maybe th there's a little bit of talking, uh, I think you're talking about something slightly different than what, what Councilmember Kitchen is talking about, so maybe I, I could phrase what I think Councilmember Kitchen is after. Uh, if the city did an analysis that we need a certain level of affordable housing and that the growth needs to contribute to that level of affordable housing, could the city create an entire new fund for affordable housing and fund it through an impact fee assessed for affordable housing? Exactly. No, because the, the impact fee act indicates that the infrastructure parks. that we can fund is related to city services, transportation, parks and recreation, public safety facilities, your utilities, and power if you're a power provider. And then there's also an environmental mitigation impact fee. There is not an impact fee classification for affordable housing. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I just have one more quick question, um, and this is really simple. Do, you, do we classify townhomes or row houses as single family or multifamily? So typically uh, that's based on the building codes within each community, um, but those are looked at as, uh, in a lot of communities, as multifamily units rather than uh, single family. But again, it depends on the, the nature of that development type. So. Uh, Within each of these, you, you reference the non-standard impact fee. Um, the city has the ability to review each development that comes in and make a classification whether they fit within single family or multifamily, as well as the developer is allowed to provide information that may suggest one category versus another. Uh, so an example of that is uh, when I completed an impact fee for South Jordan, they had some elderly housing. 
they felt was even below the multifamily classification within the city, and so they provided evidence to support that, and the city's able to review that and provide uh, potentially an adjustment. In this case, they did provide the adjustment downward as a result of the information provided by the developer. And looking at the proposed new fees um, and you know going forward, have we talked about or are we considering pegging this to inflation at all or linking it to inflation? Some communities have looked at that. Um, the statute does allow for the uh, consideration of fair comparisons and fluctuations in, in uh, valuation. We typically look at uh, adjusting the CIP based on inflation, and so putting an inflationary component on our capital infrastructure based on the timing of those projects rather than building an inflation on the final fee. Uh, from our point of view, that um, doing it the, uh, the latter, pegging you know, an inflationary variable on the fee itself, uh, may illustrate to the development community that you're raising your impact fees without going through uh, a public hearing process and re-noticing those, uh, those impact fees. And so we look at accounting for inflation in the actual projects themselves. And this question is for staff um, or the administration. Do we have an idea of when we're going to have a plan of, about how to The 10-year plan? Yeah. Is there a timeline for that? I don't know if it the wasn't, It wasn't mentioned in the transmittal, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know if the administration, administration wants to come up and ask and answer that. But when we're going to have our 10-year plan. Yes. No, to be in conjunction with this. I guess it's policy question number three. So there's there's two plans. There's the impact fees facility plan, but then there's the larger capital improvement ten-year plan that looks at all of the capital improvements needed in the city over the next ten years. Well, I can't answer that. I thought you were talking <laughs> about something else. So, um, but I can get that answer for you. I apologize. I thought you were talking about when this when we're going to submit this plan to you. For, for a recommendation from yeah. the administration? Yeah. I apologize, yeah. Well, you can answer that while you're at the table. Okay. Then, right? <laughs> we think we'll have that for you in about, uh, by the first part of October. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm Mike Greenberg, by the way. I didn't answer. <laughs> I didn't answer. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. I thought everyone knew. Yeah. Mike Greenberg. Ge generally, but but I, can get, I can absolutely get that um, question answered for you. Generally, um, maybe this is for Jennifer and City. Don't those things go together? The ten-year plan from the general fund with the impact fee plan. I mean, the last two times the city has, uh, the last two times that I've seen that the city has done an impact fee plan, it has come in conjunction with the general fund CIP plan, just because it's sort of required for this impact fee process anyway, and so most of the data is there, and that's just sort of how. Um, the administration at that point chose to look at it, but um, I think especially given the methodology change for parks impact fees, it maybe wasn't as necessary in this process, um, but certainly they're related, so. But we're wrapping up CIP pretty quickly, so it's maybe that ship has sailed. Well, that way we know exactly where the general fund is gonna have to subsidize that as well. Well, not subsidize, but match. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a a fair uh, estimate that you probably won't have it before you need to adopt this year's CIP, but certainly for the next year's process, maybe it would inform that. So, so there is in, in this plan um, a list of projects, um, transportation projects, that does, I guess, does answer the question. There is a list of projects that represent a, um, a plan over the next 10 years, transportation plan, building plan over the next 10 years, and that actually is in this plan, so I apologize. In the plan, there is a 10-year um, a project list that anticipates what we are going to be able to build based on the funding mechanisms, the conservative funding mechanisms that we are, um, believe are going to come about in the city. And I think the goal of the 10-year plan is to overlay all of the different types of capital improvement projects that the city does so that they're looked at in kind of concert. That, at least that's what, the, um, that's what the last version of the 10-year plan, which wasn't, hasn't been done for a while now, um, looked at is you know, all of the building facility needs, um, things that might not fit into impact fee categories. So. Question, Chair? You talked about uh, 
portion of eligible sort of areas for impact fees is utilities, and we haven't done that in the city that I'm aware of. Is that right? We do. We do. Yeah. yeah. I believe there are impact fees for public where, utilities, public utilities. Uh, assesses impact fees and they're separate from the impact fees we're discussing now. They weren't subject to the moratorium that was adopted last year. Mm -hmm. um, so they're established by ordinance uh, that's in the public utilities realm, collected in the public utilities budget, spent in the public utilities budget. So you don't often see them um, in the same way that you see impact fees from the general fund perspective. What's it covered under those utilities? What do you define utilities? Water, as? sewer, stormwater, I believe. Stormwater. Yeah. Anything else along those lines? Is that is that a squishy sort of definition or very hard? Um, water, sewer, storm drain, uh, power. Power. You have power. We don't do yep. because we yeah. don't have a Rocky Mountain Power is our power provider. So some municipalities have a, their own power service provisions. So. Okay. Uh, in my head, I'm just thinking of other utilities that that may be part of our thinking going forward but are not necessarily covered under the definition of utilities uh, such as wireless infrastructure mm -hmm. and wiring the city those kind of things that are not considered utilities at least officially in a lot of ways um, but i was intrigued by the concept of the utilities piece i think the issue is that if the city provides those facilities or if a private sector company provides them mm -hmm. And um, I mean, a lot of people have looked into, you know, municipal fiber, and I think that would be a, a interesting conversation about impact fees for that. But considering that the, this, this city isn't in that business currently, mm -hmm. um, we, it's not on that, on, not on the horizon at least. Yeah. So, but okay. it certainly is a good point. Yeah, telecommunications are not, not, not. listed as a applicable or an, an impact fee area. Okay, thanks. So Fred, I think that um, Derek asked you this question. Uh, maybe you could just do a follow-up for me. In researching other municipalities, um, were there any impact fees that other municipalities are charging that Salt Lake currently isn't outside of the state? So like Colorado or California? Um, I, I believe so, but I'd have to get back to you on what they're assessing. Because I know some, some communities can assess based on their state code the the require the definition of public facilities is broader than what our definition is and so there are some communities that can uh, assess impact fees for uh, alternative municipal services but the challenge with that is uh, you know the state. That's, the state governs what we can assess with regards to an impact fee and it's clearly defined what components of municipal services or county services uh, local government services that, that we can include in that analysis. And so we typically don't look at if, if communities fall outside of these areas uh, when we do comparisons. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to, to note and see if there's anything that would be worthwhile. I mean, we have some great um, people on the administration and on the council who know their way around the legislature <laughs> that maybe they could be uh, influential in looking at that. I mean, a, a good example is probably uh, rail. You know, we haven't looked at railways. There are facilities that are contemplated, but uh, they've been excluded from the impact fee analysis um, based on the statute. And that's an area where a community like Salt Lake City is likely to uh, potentially to need services and uh, could be an impact fee eligible expense if the city is providing that infrastructure. And I think it's specifically prohibited, prohibited in state law, right? Currently? Yes. So we can. We looked. We had looked at it a couple of years Mr. ago. Chair. Yes, Erin. About that, um, I'm looking at the non-standard impact fees little paragraph in here, and wondering about um, the. We've talked a little bit about the difference in uh, police attention and need at um, areas like the Hope Avenue Walmart off of Third West that. Um, has a serious impact on our police. It's about two full-time officers since they've been open year-round. And the impact of that store compared to the Target or even the Walmart in District five, 6 or 7 uh, is astronomical. Um, is that a, so yeah, is that so something that we could consider as jump a non-standard? Uh, um, the fire impact fee. 
to highlight some some of what you're suggesting. So we look at call volumes and we break it out by land use type. So in this case, residential is combined into a single category. And then we have commercial, office, and industrial. When you look at the calls per unit, and when I say per unit, it's, it's per residential dwelling unit and then per thousand square feet for non-residential development, you can see commercial on average is higher. So even looking at commercial as a category, a class unto itself, they typically generate a larger call volume as it relates to public safety services. Now when you get into further details, you may actually have businesses within this class that generate even larger call volumes here. Uh, again, the impact fee is a, is a process of averaging where we bring up into major categories those impacts and try to apportion the cost of new infrastructure to those classifications. One area to evaluate as it relates to specific businesses is pot potentially your business licensing process. So the business license legislation allows for the inclusion of a, a, a fee related to actually administering business licensing and uh, monitoring on that as a, as a basic service. And then there's also the ability to include um, disproportionate service fees. So if you have a, a specific business or subset of businesses that are producing a substantial impact on city services, then that's one avenue to capture some of that cost because that occurs on an annual basis, right? If, if you have to put an officer there all the time, that's an operations and maintenance expense and not necessarily a, it doesn't necessarily correlate to that a direct a capital investment. And so we've evaluated that for many communities looking at, and, and it typically, follows what you've suggested where you have specific commercial businesses that create a substantial impact on the system and therefore their d disproportionate fee within the business license goes up quite a bit to start pay to pay for that um, ongoing uh, operations budget. So that's, I would recommend looking at it from that perspective, from the business licensing, uh, again, because this, the impact fee is a one-time fee rather than that ongoing great. assessment. That's great advice. I don't know where we're at. Do you have any we, idea? We currently charge a disproportionate fee. I think we haven't done the deeper digging into separating out different categories of um, like big box stores, for example, because I think there are big box stores that don't have an impact and ones that do. And it sounds like what we need is a data collection um, to have a cost justification analysis, because really that's all that's right. required to change the fee structure. So, so, but I also heard that it could be an individual business within a category if they were, ha if we could document that they were having a sorry, significant it, it's, impact. Um, no, it has to be uniform across the okay. class, right. um, but we have leeway to determine what that business class is. So some average it into larger categories and other communities go into much more detail and define uh, classifications that distinguish, for example, your mom and pops versus these big no, boxes. And well, and that, and that said, I think a lot has changed in the community since the disproportionate fee analysis was done. I think it was like 10 years ago at least. Um, and so big box stores 10 years ago before Third West kind of boomed, um, we're a lot different in Salt Lake City than big box stores now. So it might be worth another look. I don't know. I, There's I also think I'm more interested in a civil penalty approach. And I'm sorry to take us, I didn't mean to take us in the weeds, but that, that piece in there about non-standard impact fees was intriguing. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and one clarification, there's also the ability to set a geographic area as a class. So y if there's a, an area hmm. within your community that- How small can that geographic is challenging, area be? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's where you may get is challenged that, based on that. Is, there, is that um I don't think defined? there's a definition with regards oh to. Oh my. But, you know, the all Wait, fees the assessed way. at the municipal level, there's a, a fairness test, you know, to look at are we implementing something that's fair or penalizing specific businesses adversely. And, you know, that, that data collection is the is the purpose of that is, is ensuring that the data is there to back up whatever fee assessment is being allocated, whether that's geographically or by business class. That's really helpful, thank you. Alrighty, so uh, while we're on the slide, um, I, time-wise, I, you know, we've gone through parks. <laughs> um, 
So, so we have a, a couple more components. I don't know, agenda-wise, how much time you've dedicated to this we variable. Until, until six, I think. Until six. Yeah. Okay. So, um, process-wise, I'll uh, just jump back a couple of slides. Um, the remaining impact fees that we've looked at are, are plan-based, where we're looking at a specific set of capital infrastructure and then allocating that infrastructure to, to demand that will be served by that infrastructure. For the purpose of the, this analysis, we've allocated Fire Station 14 and 3 and the associated costs as well as the training center renovation and large equipment garage, isolated the expansionary costs uh, and also reduce the cost by any impact fee fund balance that was av uh, available at the time of the collection of this data. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, what we're trying to get at is this column here, what is the growth-related infrastructure um, or growth-related cost uh, as it relates to the impact fee. We then take those variables and look at what is our financing strategy, what have we spent historically, uh, so the plan is proposing 26.3 million in future station costs and nearly 3 million for training facilities. Um, the 2012 analysis had it at 13.6. We're seeing an increase there just in uh, base cost. Historic CIP spending is averaged 1.2 million excluding debt and so you know we are showing disparity there if we have to sp if we have to spend approximately 2.7 to 2.8 million or 2.7 million annually, uh, we have uh, some ground to make up. And that's, in essence, the need for uh, that building authority bond that is contemplated for that uh, structure. As a result, we're pulling in the approximately 3.5 million in interest cost as associated cost for that capital infrastructure. Fire stations are also unique in that um, it's very much a system-wide level of service, and we're managing response times, geographic response times, and development within the community benefits from both existing fire stations as well as the proposed new fire stations. Um, and in public safety in general, uh, the the new infrastructure doesn't solely benefit new development. It is a shared uh, facility, and so we've looked at allocating that based on that approach. What we do is pull in the existing station value based on original cost, and, and this is original estimated cost based on depreciation statements and uh, construction the year those facilities were constructed. So it's, it's not a huge uh, dollar amount, relatively speaking. Uh, we also add in the future stations and facilities plus uh, professional expense to complete these analyses. And then look at what proportion of the calls we're projecting uh, that will come from new development over the next 10 years relative to the total demand that will be served by those facilities. So it's proportioning or allocating the cost of existing facilities and new facilities based on the demand that's generated and that's where this 20 percent comes from. Uh, however, you know, the, the impact fee facilities plan and IFA analysis is solely a requirement uh, as a result of new development so that's why 100 percent of that is brought in. But as you can see, it's not a, a huge impact on the overall cost per call. Uh, we take those values, look at the call volume, again, generated by the demand we're anticipating. Uh, sorry about that. And that gets us our cost per call of $428. We then allocate that based on the calls per unit, as we've discussed, where we look at the actual call volumes uh, over a period of time and uh, geocode those to the land use types across the city using parcel data and land use data. And that provides us our impact fee. Uh, the proposed impact fee based on this approach produces an increase in residential of 40% going from 119 to 166 uh, and a decrease for commercial office and industrial as shown in the column here on the, uh, to the right. Uh, so the same approach is then applied, uh, a similar approach is applied to police where we look at uh, the levels of service and infrastructure. Here we're looking at a sugar house precinct, uh, subtracting out the impact fee fund balance from the estimated construction year cost. It gives us a total of 5.9 million. 
we do not have at this time a, finan a financing mechanism, so we haven't included any interest costs. We have included the inflation component, but uh, if a, a bond were sought, uh, for example, for this facility, then that may necessitate an update to this component of the impact fee, so we would potentially update just the, the police component uh, uh, within the impact fee structure. Alternatively, if, for example, a general obligation bond were utilized similar to the existing public safety complex, then that may necessitate a revision uh, to potentially reduce the impact fee or eliminate it altogether, because with a general obligation bond, there's an associated debt levy, which would be assessed to both existing and new development, and so they'd be paying for their, uh, theoretically, their impact through that property tax levy. Now, it may not be proportionate, their proportionate impact, uh, so there, the credit could produ produce a, a variation on this that may not put it to zero. Uh, arguably, they could be paying more than their proportional share of that facility, depending on its useful life and the, the uh, uh, structure of that uh, general obligation bond, but that's getting into the weeds a little bit. Uh, as of now, we haven't included any interest. Similarly, we've looked at that fair share build-out approach saying this is really going to benefit the community through build-out and looking at what portion of the calls we're anticipating from demand within the IFF, uh, IFFP planning horizon at uh, 23%. That produces a cost per call of $88. Uh, you can see that generates a increase again in residential, an increase in commercial, which speaks to that uh, proportional call volume that's generated typically from commercial development. We typically see this in most communities that commercial uh, 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 entities generate uh, more call volume uh, as it relates to public safety services on a per unit basis. Uh, but office and industrial is declining uh, based on those call volumes. I will note that this is a departure from the previous study and, and much more specific. Um, we're looking at actual call volumes and defining the level of service based on those call volumes by, by land use type, which results in a fluctuation, uh, a differing fluctuation for each land use type uh, within, within the city. All righty, to uh, transportation, this is typically a, a little bit more challenging as it relates to the impact fee process. Um, just by nature of this infrastructure, uh, uh, it's a, you know, in essence, a grid of roadways and, and transportation infrastructure that's utilized by all development within the community. Uh, we have no control over where traffic goes except through signalization or congestion. And so it's a, a very connected system, which also led us to reestablish in this uh, 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 planning process a single citywide service area as it relates to transportation. When we look at the existing facilities, uh, the, the information, it was a little more comprehensive uh, as it relates to transportation infrastructure with a total of 338.6 million in transportation infrastructure. The 2012 study showed a cost of uh, an existing value of 1.72 billion, but that was a replacement value or a, a value in 2012 dollars and the statute prohibits utilizing that as a a calculation in the actual determination of the impact fee. You can use it for comparison purposes, but we cannot calculate our buy-in to existing infrastructure based on a, a replacement value. It has to be the original value. And, and if I could just um, but uh, jump in here, um, I don't want to take us too far into the weeds, but I do think it's an important thing for the council to understand that um, uh, what, what your impact fee dollars will buy you is already from the start not uh, as uh, as much as maybe you know it's going to be. So, in other words, the um, existing inventory is undervalued from common sense perspective. So they have to they the consultants are required by law to go off of what we originally spent when we built the roads or what we originally um, outlaid. It could have been 40 years ago, 30 years ago. We all know that those costs are totally different than what it would take to build a road now. Um, but those are the those are the dollars, that's the calculation that's used to determine how much fees we're collecting in order to build roads now. So the statute kind of builds in a little bit of a, a disadvantage to the cities in terms of actually collecting the dollars you need 
to, and then this is just my opinion, it's a little editorial, but <laughs> um, build it, b builds in a disadvantage to the cities to actually collecting the dollars you need to build the facilities. So um, that, that disadvantage has to be made up by some other funding source, um, most likely the general fund, um, if it's not something else. So just as a kind of, so you know before, <laughs> before yes. we go. So, uh, and that's definitely true. Uh, usually when there's a buy-in, uh, w when there's a weighting towards this buy-in component, it has the tendency to pull the impact fee down because we're using historic dollars. Level of service-wise, what we typically look at um, is a grading system as it relates to roadways. Uh, this is somewhat challenging for uh, several communities because specific road segments may fall above or below this, so we're looking at an average level of service across the service area. Where a road segment falls below this or is uh, receiving a poorer grade, whether that's a D or an F, um, that would be considered a deficiency and impact fees cannot be used to bring that up to the level of service of C. If uh, the grade is higher, where we have uh, free, more free movement of traffic and we, we have a higher grade, then that's uh, potentially an area where we could uh, pull in that buy-in where there's excess capacity in a roadway. It's also, uh, again, the, as I've highlighted, the complexity here is that as you build additional infrastructure, it actually changes the grading on road segments uh, because it frees up capacity potentially in, in uh, roadways, alternative roadways that may have been failing or now at a, a different level of service because of a, a road improvement in another location within the community. So that's really speaks to that, um, the service area being very related uh, and extending that uh, service area across the city because the infrastructure is intended to benefit the city as a whole. And could you just talk a little more about, uh, because we haven't traditionally had this as a citywide uh, impact fee, so could you talk a little bit more about that rationale versus a uh, geographical regional? Um, yeah, so um, the Transportation Department looked at uh, an analysis of trips and looked at where the trips were occurring within the city and where they were going. And the analysis uh, indicated that there is a free flow of traffic throughout the community, meaning we can't, you know, a development within a certain location, the trips aren't isolated necessarily to that location. Um, and are free to move throughout the community and, and whether that's north to south or east to west. And so that, uh, based on that analysis, uh, it was the opinion of the of staff to look at a single citywide service area because of the flow of traffic being citywide. Um, the previous study actually also uh, uh, established a single citywide service area from, a, from an analytical standpoint the history is there to have a single citywide service area. Uh, I think there was some policy decisions with regards to that and, and the actual implementa implementation of that shifted, but from the actual impact fee calculation, it was uh, calculated based on a single citywide service area. And many communities across the state establish single citywide service areas for transportation based on those reasons that uh, traffic does flow throughout the city. Uh, there still may be at a future point justification for changing that uh, within the impact fee analysis. Um, I think the, the uh, master plan, any master plan initiatives uh, should help uh, solidify that as we move forward as well. It, you know, if there is a need to establish uh, separate service areas. We, we caution again against that, again, because the, just the relationship of trips um, uh, throughout the community um. Um, and not to complicate this even further, but I think the other um, unknown that um, is going to factor into the city in the next five to ten years, and I don't know if the planning horizon is five years or if it's seven years or ten, um, but the northwest quadrant, at, in theory, will develop, um, sp especially as the prison gets built and roads need to be put in and other infrastructure needs to be put in. And right now, unless um, I didn't see something, but... Right now, there's not roads necessarily planned no. in the Northwest Quadrant, even though the Northwest Quadrant is part of the service area that's drawn. So in theory, it could be a recipient of impact fees. Um, so I think it might be a balancing question of if you think you're going to build a road in the Northwest Quadrant to service the development around the prison in the next three years, it might be wise to put in a placeholder. But if it's 
five to 10 years, maybe it's just in the next update of the impact fees plan. But yeah, so right now, our discussion with uh, transportation focused on what improvements would be necessary to maintain connectivity within this service area as it is today and what we project moving forward. And it's really, you know, east-west connectivity, signalization, uh, pedestrian safety devices, and those types, types of things across the city and maintaining that connectivity east to west. Um, if those assumptions change with regards to the capital infrastructure and you see a substantial need for investment within a specific area rather than the investment as it's shown, which is maintaining connectivity uh, across the system, then yes, uh, it could necessitate an update to the impact fee and potentially the creation of a separate service area as it relates to uh, specific types of improvement improvements. So some communities have established a, s a single service area for system improvements and then isolated a separate service area for a subset of projects that are specific to that. The, the challenge is, is the Impact Fee Act delineates project improvements versus system improvements and the city has to define is this service area really a project and therefore these are project improvements and should be worked out through uh, a, an alternative mechanism uh, whether that's a service area or development agreements or whatever it is, to provide for that infrastructure uh, for that project. If those improvements are really designed to serve that project plus additional growth that may be adjacent to that service area within that service area, um, then that may, the, the impact fee may be an appropriate funding mechanism to, to provide that infrastructure within that service area. Um, it's, it's just a challenge to evaluate the bleed of that traffic and, and really say only the development within this area is going to utilize those roadways and therefore we're only going to assess an impact fee within that service area for that infrastructure. And so we, we have to be able to prove that in order to establish that service area. Uh, and it seems to me that the uh, other advantage to this system is that we have more flexibility to improve our system bottlenecks where we haven't in the past, where we've uh, created a geographic restriction or we've been project-based where it's very much about one or two street improvements that we're looking at funding. But if we're saying we're maintaining a level of service, that could be in a lot of things. It could be signal improvement, it could be um, additional lanes, it could be all kinds of things Correct. wherever that's necessary through the city. Correct, and, okay. and that is, you know, based on the nature of the projects, that's how the projects have been pulled in as well, uh, then matching it to historic funding tweaks that a little bit as we'll discuss. But it is, it's designed to create that flexibility so you can meet the needs of development across that service area uh, with the necessary improvements, transportation improvements. Okay, Cindy. Just um, one quick thing and that is that um, as was mentioned, the, there are some base assumptions or base policy kind of forks in the road uh, as part of this. And those things are within the purview of the council. If you wanted to uh, have you know more discussion or anything like that at a future date, is that? Yes, yeah, this, this plan isn't finalized. Um, there definitely are assumptions that go into this, which we're, reviewing, but um, it is a lot to digest and uh, definitely available to review that further. And uh, we, we really need that input to finalize the document as we prepare for adoption and public hearing and the actual ordinance. So all of that will be very valuable. So something that would be helpful, and I don't know how engaged you've been in this process in the Northwest Quadrant, but there, there are very specific street construction projects that will be servicing just the, the, the new development in that area. Um, but there will also be some need to provide access and, and, and I don't think we've uh, even begun to evaluate what might need to happen in our system to provide access to that corner of the city. But looking at how we might identify uh, funding specific to that area and I, I, I'm what I'm hearing is we may have to have an overlay zone or some other component yes. that could help us or and and I know there are other funding mechanisms that are being considered as um, impact fees as well um, but that would be a really helpful assessment I think and I know it's a little it's vague because we don't 
know exactly what's going to happen out there, and we don't know the real timeline for some of that development, but it does seem sufficient to assume there's going to be some street development out there that's pretty internal to that area and, and benefits the users in that area, um, and how do we separate that out from the commuters that yeah. are going that area? It's definitely a challenge. Uh, you know, again, I'll bring up South Jordan. They had two specific service areas with the Daybreak community and the city proper area and uh, different development demands within the Daybreak area and all of the development agreements there. So uh, it does um, require analysis with regards to just that of what is the internal trips within that service area and uh, apportioning costs based on those inter internal trips and what is the relationship between the two service areas to show that there may be a portion of that infrastructure that needs to be covered by the city service area as a whole and a portion of those costs may need to be covered by just that service area and that will require some analysis with regards to the trip relationship in that in that area. Um, the benefit of this process as it is now is we're identifying the costs that that are benefiting the service area as a whole and so <coughs> analyzing that will show what increase in cost is necessary and it it's already identifying that that ex, that that increase and and now what do we do with that how do we allocate that uh, within the impact fee process uh, when we look at um, the capital improvement plan as we've received it uh, there, there is, we did receive a, a 10 year estimate of projects and it, it definitely will be important to look at, um, you know, ensuring that the CIP and, and the impact fee facilities plan dovetail. Um, as of now, we, we're showing a total cost of 327 million and uh, capital need uh, in construction year costs. Of that, uh, a small portion, relatively speaking, is impact fee eligible. Uh, 41 million dollars, almost 42 million dollars. When you look at the impact fee fund balance as a credit, that brings it down to 34 million dollars, um, or 3.4 million annually. Uh, so this really, as in most communities I work with, uh, there's a similar issue across the state, that there's a substantial infrastructure need uh, as it relates to transportation, a lot of it's repair and replacement, and so the impact fees can only cover a portion of that and, and there's still a substantial need. What we've compared is, again, looking at this amount here, uh, there are some other entity uh, funding mechanisms that may be available, whether that's through Wasatch Front or uh, other governmental entities or grants. Um, we've, we've looked at some of that allocation. It still leaves quite a bit, almost uh, 300 million for city uh, need or $30 million annually. So. Historically, when you look at what's been spent historically, um, we're showing, based on historic funding, $11 million expended out annually. So there's a need to, to really make up that difference of approximately $20 million to, to $25 million annually. Uh, the impact fees cannot be used to do that except for the growth-related portion. And so for the impact fee, we've made an adjustment across the board to bring the uh, city funded expenditures down to something that's more realistic based on that historic allocation which we spoke of earlier. We, uh, we're trying to make a, a schedule that's realistic based on that historic funding but if that were to change uh, that could potentially necessitate an update to this analysis. Uh, we didn't bring it down to the 11 million annually. I kept it at, um, as I'll show you here, or sorry in the next slide I dropped it down to about a 15 million annually, so it, it still considers that there may be some additional funding available. Uh, what I've provided in the next two slides is a comparison of what the maximum calculated impact fee, assuming we funded 100% of that infrastructure, the 327 million, as well as uh, a full buy-in to that infrastructure uh, that has already uh, been constructed. That produces a cost per trip of $203. When you apply that to the trip uh, factors per land use type, that produces a 379% increase in single family units, 471% uh, increase in multifamily. Retail would go up by 209% up from $3,000 to $10,000 per 1,000 square feet. So you can see there's a substantial increase that would occur if we were to 
include all of that valuation and uh, assume new development in the next 10 years has to cover uh, their, their share of that. Um, you know, ba again, based on that historic evaluation, we, I just did not see that as a realistic approach. Uh, you, and so we had provided an adjustment to this um, valuation and pulled that down, uh, looking at 156 million, which is 15 million, so it's still expending more than what, you've, what you have historically, um, but providing a, maybe that realistic adjustment based on the historic funding uh, expenditures. We've also excluded the buy-in component, um, uh, so that uh, has been removed as well. Uh, there could be, you know, again, going to the, to the policy initiatives to, to bring that valuation back in. Um, the challenge with the buy-in variable is uh, having the analysis to back that up. So what I've done in this, for the purpose of this study, where this 8% is coming from, it's looking at the proportional trips, the 302 trips, 302,000 302, trips, relative to a, uh, the trip counts at build-out. And that growth in the next 10 years represents 8% of that, uh, that evaluation. Ideally, uh, when we look at buy-in, we like, we, we like to uh, look at an engineering analysis of existing roadways and looking at those roadways that have excess capacity based on that level of service grade and pulling in only the, the valuation based on a weighted calculation of that capacity analysis. So uh, absent to that, there, there is some risk by including that buy-in variable without the analysis to back it up. Some communities still have done this, you know, looked at, you know, applying a proportion of existing facilities based on that uh, trip count. Um, also, the exclusion is based on your history. You have, to, to date, not included a buy-in in your impact fee calculation, so this is, uh, you know, would, would represent continuing that policy with regards to buy-in uh, for, for your f uh, transportation impact fee. Uh, this is another area where the council could choose to sort of alter that. Yes, yeah, so the inclusion of that buy-in could uh, change this variable. Uh, if we adopt the, uh, the proposed impact fee, so in essence what's that, what that is doing is requiring new development to pay their proportional impact of new infrastructure, so, so you're funding that new infrastructure that's necessary for the system. And that's what the impact fee is calculated to do. Uh, based on that approach, the impact fees are going down across the board uh, with the bigger increases occurring in office, or sorry, bigger decreases um, uh, occurring in office and industrial development, and that's based on the trip counts uh, and trip weighting factors for those land use types. When we combine all of that uh, for each of the impact fees, if we were to assess, again, the maximum calculated impact fee, uh, assuming we put in all of the buy-in as well as all of the capital infrastructure, uh, you can see most of the impact fees would be going up with the bigger increases percentage-wise occurring for commercial development, going from $3,630 up to $10,480. Primarily driven by, again, that increase in the transportation impact fee. When you look at the impact fee under the revised scenario based on the elimination of the buy-in component as well as uh, pegging the uh, future expenditures to historic uh, with some consideration of additional funding mechanisms, uh, single family would go up by 62%. That's primarily driven by the increase in the park impact fee. Uh, multifamily would stay roughly the same, an increase of 5%, and then commercial, office, and industrial would decrease by 45%, 81%, and 87%, respectively. It's also important to note that uh, while there is a decrease in these impact fees per unit, we are broadening the base as it relates to the transportation and establishing a citywide service area, so we'd be assessing that to all development across the community rather than just the uh, west side and northwest quadrant development. And so we would see, you know, this decrease in the per unit fee, but potentially uh, additional revenues generated from broadening the base of the impact fee collection area. And I think this is a key um, component to understand of this is the net effect of deciding on a citywide service area versus um, 
uh, more specified smaller service areas is that the fee is lower because more people pay it. Um, but then that means that more people pay for the projects that are needed and especially in the road category most of the projects appear to be needed on the west side so um, it's just well, that uh, in the previous study that's that's the case but in this study there are quite a few uh, you know the p pedestrian safety devices sure. signalization so when you look at the actual growth related cost it's when you look at uh, uh, the two variables uh, it's, it's fairly evenly split uh, of that $34 million for those types of inf infrastructure. And engineering also looked at the, that uh, capital investment and really isolated what, what infrastructure is needed to maintain, again, that connectivity across our system. And that's what's being pulled into the impact fee. So it's, we're, we're uh, again, based on that service area, we reevaluated the projects and looked at what would be necessary for the system as a whole. Uh, therefore justifying that citywide service area. Um, so there's a little bit of shift in that. So for, thank you, we're out of time. I just want to check in to see if other council members have uh, any additional questions or comments. But I do have one question I'd like you to just uh, illustrate us, uh, for us what cautions we might want to consider if we're in particular looking at transportation and there's a $20 million gap in what our projected needed. I mean, that's conservative gap. And if we're looking at other funding streams to close that gap, how, what considerations do we need to make to how that might impact impact fees? I think it's determining if, if there's going to be bond financing that could result in a change to the impact fee because there may be associated interest cost. Uh, if it's a geo bond, it could influence that if there's a specific property tax levy. If there's a fee assessment, so some communities are looking at a fee assessment, um, that uh, produ may produce some uh, challenges as it relates to uh, legislative impacts across the state. Um, you know, traditionally, we, we haven't looked at those as a utility, transportation as a utility and establishing a, a fee for service. But, but in particular, if we're looking at bond or property tax levy, um, it, it, the concern is the idea of double charging um, yeah. new development. So it, if that bond is utilized to fund repair and replacement, then we're not, right? We're, we're using a bond to cover that uh, deficiency that everybody will so pay for we, that. So we would want to very specifically look at maintenance, yes. not upgrades of facilities. Yes. Yeah. Although Bond Council has other um, cautions about maintenance as it relates to bonding. So, yes. <laughs> yes, so we have competing statutes that we need to kind of thread. <laughs> yeah, so just from so. the impact, impact fee perspective, bonding for maintenance is uh, a, an it keeps you out risk, of that yes. risk of, of, of uh, legal challenge. Yes, but okay. from a bonding standpoint and the security and all of those variables, there's there's other risks associated with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Fred, and uh, um, thank you for your participation, council members and staff. Um, and we'll see you again. I hope that's okay. <laughs> yes. Um, it's always a pleasure. We're going to move on now to um, our board appointments, and I apologize to those who are here in the audience because I noticed that several of our appointments have arrived. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'll, I'll just say that we didn't make you wait very long because sometimes we've made board appointments wait a long time. So our first board appointment is Diane Stewart, who has been proposed as an appointment to the Cultural Corps Budget Committee. Diane, could you... Um, make yourself available here at the table and in front of one of the microphones. And um, uh, for everyone, um, I think our microphones are working now. I still recommend you pull that close to you so you're a little bit like a rock star. And uh, give us a, a quick introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest and, and qualifications for this particular appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, I, um, I've been involved in the arts in Utah and Salt Lake City for uh, probably 15 years. I've served on a lot of councils, Utah Arts Council, Vice Chair. 
I serve on a lot of nonprofit boards now, and I own Modern West Fine Art uh, on the corner of Second and Second. So I have a very big interest in what is happening in our city today in regard to the arts and culture, and uh, would like to see it activated and enlivened in a way that will support uh, progressive um, artistic venues. Thank you, Diane. Any questions, comments? Mr. Chair. Yes, Derek. I, I just want to thank Diane for being so involved in arts and culture in our community. I know that you've been paying attention to the cultural core for some time. Uh, do you have um, any, uh, uh, any criticisms or positive feedback to offer so far? on the process? Oh, well, I've sat in on several meetings and the process is still unfolding. We, we yesterday received um, uh, preliminary plans for the cultural core. So um, it's, it's been a lively uh, discussion and uh, I think there's been a lot of input. We have outside, uh, an outside consulting team that is, is working with us. So uh, I think good things are coming and uh, we're, we're going to get ready to meet again with them and uh, continue the process. So I'm, I'm excited and hopeful. Thanks. Let me just say you handled that very well because that was a bit of a trick question. So uh, I think you caught that, though, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and Erin wants to say how much she loves board appointments. <laughs> I whispered that to Stan, but I really love board appointments. I love looking at our agenda and seeing names of um, friends and acquaintances and people I look up to who are just here to volunteer their time to make sure that we do the best, the most, and the most uh, wise decisions we can on some of the most important parts of why we live in this city. We live in Salt Lake City because of cool things like art. Absolutely. And the way it's distinguished from other cities um, in the West. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have a very distinct city here. It requires a distinct vision. And I'm looking forward to being involved with the, the concepts. So well, we're grateful for yours and the others that we're going to meet tonight. Uh, for Thanks, your time Diane. and your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Diane, thank you. You've heard how much we appreciate your willingness to serve uh, on a city board and how much we appreciate your time and commitment. Um, you are scheduled on our consent agenda for this evening. You do not need to be present. Um, it's one of those raffles where you can win and not be here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but you're welcome to stay if you would like. Right. And again, thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Our next board appointment under consideration is Lucinda Kindred, who has been uh, recommended for an appointment to the library board. And Cindy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here following Diane. It's just terrific and she will make a fabulous addition to the cultural core. Uh, maybe we should have board members uh, make recommendations for other board appointments as part of the um, introduction. I think that would be very interesting since you just did that. Um, could you do the same thing? Give us a little background about yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about you and why you're, you're uh, interested and qualified for the library board. Well, I've lived here for now almost 35 years and I've been involved in a lot of uh, organizations, uh, many of which have to do with uh, the humanities and the libraries. I certainly put within that. Uh, I've been on uh, at one time the museum's board and I've been on the um, Humanities Council uh, board and so uh, and I love books and I think libraries are a place where you can really even out a community it's a place where everybody can come everybody can learn um, it's just a hugely important asset to a community and we are so lucky here to have the library system we have so you have a new head librarian and it might be a wonderful time to be on the board as a new board member. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Mr. Chair? Yes, Lisa. I just really love that you have a library book in your hand. That's, <laughs> yes, I can't. Oh, I, I just donated 50 <laughs> boxes of library books because I don't have room in my house anymore, so I have to definitely now just take them and put them back. <laughs> well, well done. Thank you so much for your willingness to do this. Thanks, we appreciate Lisa. it. Thanks very much. And I just want to acknowledge how much personally I appreciate your commitment to this community. Um, 
you were very involved in the early days of the Utah AIDS Foundation, and so that is something that doesn't go unnoticed, and, and especially in a time when that was uh, a little bit of a risky place to be. So I really appreciate your willingness to make those types of commitments to our community and, and where we see need. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, Erin. Um, I want to echo those thanks and thanks to our administration for connecting you with this position. I know that um, Cindy has had a part in important and significant processes from the university to the 4th Street Clinic and a lot of places in between. So really, you are such a quality appointment to <laughs> a, a board um, in a financial and an arts capacity and your vision of culture in this city. And I'm really grateful that you're doing this. And um, there's not many people who love boards, particularly unpaid boards. So <laughs> thanks for adding <laughs> uh, the service to our city to your awesome background. Thank you. Thank you so much. Asuna. And we, this is part of the public record. So now is part of your official record that you love boards. So <laughs> your future <laughs> has been determined. Um, but thank this you. It's a special honor. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank you, Cindy. And uh, same thing. You're on our uh, consent agenda for this evening. You do not need to be present. And we look forward to uh, having you on our library board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next appointment is a board appointment for the City and County Building Conservancy and Use Committee, and it's Jennifer Hale. Jennifer, could you please, uh, I'm going to invite you up to sit and uh, take a little time to tell us about yourself and your interest in this particular committee. All right. Um, I am a native Utahn and lived here all my life. I am a, a licensed landscape architect. Um, have been in the profession for nine years and do landscape architecture and planning work for um, Landmark Design. Um, Landmark Design kind of has a long history on this board. They helped with the master plan and, and Jan Streifel and Mark Blasek have both been on the committee and kind of feel like it's um, part of our history. Um, and I my interest in this position or uh, on this committee is that I, I think that this building is an icon of our city. It represents everything that's good about this place, the history, the hard work that went into building it in the beginning, and then the great community events that happen here today, uh, and as well as the, the professionals that have helped preserve this building. We have great human capital in this city today, um, engineers, architects, preservationists, you name it, and they've all helped keep this place intact, and I'd be glad to help in that, contribute my skills to that effort, so. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions or comments for Jennifer? I know it's hard to believe. I think Landmark did the landscape plan 30 years ago yeah, during so. the <laughs> reconstruction of this building, and so that's yeah. a long commitment, so. Yeah. And clearly, um, it's held up well. So thank you very much. Uh, again, you're on the consent agenda. Do not need to be present. And uh, we so appreciate your willingness to serve. Uh, and thank you for those comments about the importance of uh, this particular committee. I don't know if everybody knows about it, but there's a review committee for this very building. And uh, I think one of the reasons it's still in the condition it is today is because this committee was uh, put in place back uh, 30 years ago during the reconstruction that is uh, very carefully guarding the historic nature of this facility. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next appointment is, uh, an, uh, well, actually, I'm going to combine these two. There are two appointments to our Historic Landmarks Commission. I would uh, like to invite Stanley Adams and Paul Svensson to come forward, and if you could each take a seat, and then I'll just have you take turns. Uh, you kind of get the routine. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this particular uh, appointment and uh, anything we might uh, benefit from uh, why you think you're qualified for that. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I'm Paul Svensson. Uh, I grew up in a historic Salt Lake City neighborhood. I live in a very old, wonderful Avenues house. Uh, Stan can attest to the fact that it was a wreck when we bought it and thanks in part to the 
Landmarks Commission. It's a wonderful, you know, continuing to be a vibrant contributor to, to our city. Um, I'm a former attorney. I'm a very small level real estate developer and I'm a real estate agent. Um, I worked um, somewhat on the city's behalf for years as the project manager for the Tracy Aviary which, uh, as they were going through their large bond funded um, overhaul. And in all of those capacities, I've appeared before the Landmarks Commission a number of times. I'm sure it's more than a dozen. Um, and it's always been a really positive, constructive, um, helpful experience. Um, so I um, think about joining the commission with no agenda other than trying to be another one of the friendly places that have always been there before. It can be an intimidating, um, complex process that uh, a typical layperson, I mean, I think half the people that live in historic districts don't even know that the landmarks process is required. And I hope that I can be a help and, a, you know, rather than an adversary in helping people uh, move forward with their properties while maintaining the lovely character of these historic neighborhoods that we all love so totally much. Thank you, Paul. Any questions for Paul or comments? He did an amazing job on his house, which was a disaster when he started. <laughs> Everything he said is true. <laughs> so, uh, Stanley, welcome. Stan Thank or Stanley? Only matter. my mother calls it's, me Stanley, an so awful lot but other names I respond know. to it. So. <laughs> um, and there aren't Steve very many. Steve and Sam. Okay, you know, you probably looks like you've got the same problem. Uh, my name is Stan Adams. I'm 70 years old. I'm a, still a practicing attorney for the last 44 years. I think I, I don't know why I'm sitting here exactly, other than I got an invitation or a notice in the mail, and I'm not sure why or from who, but it asked me if I was interested, and I said yes, and filled out some information, and here I sit. So. Uh, my interest in this sort of thing, I think, has been about, <clears throat> I purchased a home on 73 G Street. Oh, and I think in 73, one that was slated to be torn down and because of the new restrictions on old folks' home with uh, fire protection systems and things of that nature, and it was going to be torn down, and I bought it sight unseen just because it was a beautiful exterior and renovated. And, it's still one of, I think, one of the avenue's nicer historical sites. I presently own a home on uh, <clears throat> 680 East, 600 South, the southwest corner of 6 South and 7th East. It's been a, I bought it from Wally Wright, who did the trolley square development. And I live and work out of that house. I have uh, some family members that are tenants, you might say, but it's a uh, it's a home that I restored and did from top to bottom, side to side, and inside out, and I'm proud of it. It's, uh, I like doing those things. I took some time a few years ago, became a master gardener just because I love that sort of activity, and it goes along with restoration, I think. I own a home out in Layton. I don't know if any of you know where the Layton Parkway intersects Flint Street right by the new IHC hospital. It's just uh, north of that, but I have an acre with an old 1880 farm on it that uh, is what I really call kind of my art project. It's what I've been working on for 25 years. It's got five buildings on it. I like restoration. I like uh, heritage. I'd rather see an old home or an old building restored than a new one built, quite candidly. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I have nothing wrong with new construction, but I do like to, to preserve good old stuff. Uh, that's it for me. Okay, thanks, Stan. Any questions for Stan? Yes, Lisa. sir. Um, first, I have to say, of course, he likes your first name. I personally like your last name. <laughs> I and, <laughs> and, uh, and you answered one of my questions. You are evidently the Northern Utah Adams rather than the Davis turkey County. ranching, the turkey ranching Adams from um, Utah County. Stuart Adams, so. the senator, is a yeah. first cousin. Right. 
So now that we've made those connections, but I married into the Adams country and we're the turkey ranchers in Utah County apparently, but we go way back. But I have a question for both of you. And um, I only think it's fair that when we recently had a historic landmarks commission appointee before us, I asked this question and Stan told me it was really hard, but I think it's an important question. Um, it's really tough in this role to look at things and to determine, you just said you'd rather see something um, restored than rebuilt. What if it is in such disrepair that it, it is going to be way more expensive than anyone can afford to repair it? Do you then allow something to be torn down if something is rebuilt in the area that is compatible with the surrounding area, even though it's, some people would call it instant old, or do you in, insist that someone hang on to the property till someone has the money to do it? And I, and I always am torn on this one because I really care about old structures. I grew up on the avenues, lived in a house that was built in 1926 and then moved to one that was built in 1902. So I, I really have a value for that. But how, how do you see that? Because what we have happened is we don't want to incentivize people to let their properties fall into disrepair till we allow them to tear it down. On the other hand, if someone purchases a home that is in such terrible condition in the hope that they can build something that's useful and really is a contributing structure by what it becomes, how do you weigh those two things? And, and there's no easy answer on it, I know. <laughs> um, well, my sense is that the uh, commission, the ordinance that governs the commission has done a really nice job of striking a balance on that point. Um, there is a provision for economic hardship that allows a historic structure to be taken down and there are criteria for analyzing what constitutes a hardship. Um, and in those cases that satisfy those criteria, which are rigorous, um, I think we have a process in place to allow compatible, reasonable new construction to move forward. Um, what I like about the ordinance is that it uh, prohibits, say, a nefarious developer from purchasing a uh, rundown structure and then they claim financial hardship, having known full well that the property was a problem. Um, I think that is something we probably want to discourage, and I think the ordinance does a good job of doing that. Stan, what do you think? Uh, <clears throat> How do they say it in the law? It's very fact sensitive, I think. Stan, could I get you to pull that mark? Oh, there, finally. thank you. Thank you. I, I see problems both ways and solutions both ways. Uh, I've been to the Landmarks Commission meetings two or three times in the last 10 years, I think, or maybe a few times more, and grappled with the interesting things that I learned they thought about that I never thought they'd think about, to be right honest with you. But I have a high degree of faith in a, in a guy putting his money where his mouth is, and if he wants to spend the money to do it and do it correctly so it's safe and beautiful and compatible, I'm all to let a man do that. I mean, I believe in his right to do that, I suppose. But uh, I don't know. I've never seen this situation, I think, that you're talking about where somebody wants to, what, buy an old dilapidated property and, and tear it down? Is that the reason, you know? That sort Sometimes, of yeah. Well, I, I think he can have a decision whether he wants to restore it or whether he tears it down. You know? You know that sort of thing. I think we could give advice. Now, I imagine that's why there's more than one or two people on this commission, so we all can share our thoughts and solutions. Because, you know, one man's junk is another man's treasure, and I do believe in that uh, it, and letting them express it if if it's appropriate, but not if it's inappropriate. And I guess that's what we have to grapple with. Well, it sounds to me like both of you will be very thoughtful as you go forward and make decisions that will impact sensitive areas in our city. And I really appreciate your willingness to serve. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you both so much for your willingness to serve. And again, we will uh, uh, have you on our cons we do have you on our consent agenda for this evening. You do not need to be present, um, but thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you on the Landmarks Commission. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we are on to item uh, number nine in our agenda, which is a report and announcement from the executive director, Cindy. I'm so busy listening to interviews that I don't even know if I have announcements. I'm sorry. And I don't I remember don't. either. You I don't. don't. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're good. That uh, concludes our briefing session of uh, council meeting today. Uh, our dinner is ready, I believe, over over this way and uh, we will reconvene across the hall at seven o'clock where councilmember mendenhall will be officiating our formal meeting thank you